Are hot. They're picking up for the YouTube and the. And we're live. Okay, cool. All right. I call the 2,356th meeting of the Milwaukee City Council to order. This meeting is being conducted in person at City Hall and by video conference. The public is. But the public may participate in this meeting by coming to City Hall, joining the Zoom webinar, or watching on the city's YouTube channel or Comcast cable channel 30 in city limits. There will be opportunities for the public to speak during the community comment time and during the public hearing. If you would like to address council, you may come to City Hall. Seating in chambers is limited and speakers will be asked to leave after the part of the meeting you're interested in is finished. If you are interested in speaking, please let staff know by emailing ocr at milwaukeeoregon.gov for those on Zoom or submitting a yellow comment card for those at City Hall. When it is time to take public comment, staff will monitor the comment cards, email inbox, the Zoom participant list, and chat. We will take comments in the order they are received and seen. Written comments may be emailed to ocr at milwaukeeoregon.gov. <coughs> The public may also participate in the Zoom webinar by phone by dialing 1-253-215-8782, entering webinar ID 841-6722-7661, and passcode 0974-79. If you are calling in through Zoom and would like to make a comment, dial star nine to raise your hand. Spanish translation services are available upon request. The public is asked to request translation and other meeting accessibility services at least 48 hours before the meeting. Contamos con servicio de traducción al español cuando se solicitado. Se pide al público que solicite servicios de traducción y otros servicios de accesibilidad para reuniones por lo menos uh, 48 horas antes de la reunión. Translation services are also available in other languages. All right, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The city of Milwaukee respectfully acknowledges that our community is located on the ancestral homeland of the Clackamas people. In 1855, the surviving members of the Clackamas signed the Willamette Valley Treaty, also known as the Kalapuya Etc. Treaty, with the federal government in good faith. We are, offer our respect and gratitude to the indigenous people of this land. Tonight, one of the big things we'll be doing is passing a tree code, which will hopefully make our city better stewards of the forests, our urban forests at any rate, um, as were the indigenous people of this area for millennia. Uh, announcements. Celebrate Earth Day by, vo by volunteering at a restoration event on Saturday, April 23rd from 9, a from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. The event will take place at Willow Place Natural Area in the Lake Road neighborhood. 
joined city manager Ann Ober at an upcoming open door session on Tuesday, April 26th from 9 to 11 a.m. at City Hall. Sessions are limited to 15 minutes to accommodate as many sessions as possible. Don't forget to bring your unused or expired prescription drugs and sensitive documents to be shredded to the Public Safety Building on Saturday, April 30th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Scott Park is being reimagined and we need your participation. The community is invited to, to a park celebration with food and family activities on Sunday, May 1st from 10.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. The event includes fun opportunities to provide feedback about what you would like to have in the park. Scott Park is located beside the Letting Library. The 2022 season of the Milwaukee Sunday Farmers Market begins on Sunday, May 1st from 9.30 a.m. to 2 p.m. The market will operate again this year in the parking lot at Harrison Street and Main Street in downtown. For more information about each of these events and others, please visit the city's homepage at milwaukeeoregon.gov or call 503-786-7555 and staff will provide you with the information you need or connect you with someone who can help. Lisa. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to announce that the Milwaukee Parks Foundation is uh, this month has their campaign Bring Play to Milwaukee Bay, uh, raising money for the play area in Milwaukee Bay Park. S several downtown businesses have um, taken part in this and each Wednesday different businesses are giving a portion of their proceeds to the park fund. Um, tomorrow it is Mother Cluckers, which for those who don't know, Mother Cluckers is one of the food carts over in Milwaukee Station food cart pod. Um, it's Cha 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 and it's also Milwaukee Floral. They have a grab and go bouquet that's available each week and a portion of their proceeds from selling those um, go to the park as well. So that's tomorrow the 20th and then next Wednesday which is the last Wednesday of the of the campaign and of the month it's a decibel and ovation and again Milwaukee Floral. So um, please those are a great uh, way that you can support two things. You can support a local business and you can support the park at the same time. So please uh, go out and do that on Wednesdays. Thank you. Thank you. And I had one quick one to add to. Good. I just saw this online right before our meeting that uh, Hector Campbell Neighborhood Association has uh, adopted its very first stretch of road through um, our adopt a road program and they are offering this as one of the things that you could do on Earth Day if you want to get out and celebrate um, and you can meet in the parking lot of Chapel Theater at 10 a.m. and they'll have supplies and they'll be heading out from there to do some cleanup along their road. Excellent. Anybody else? Anything? All right, well that brings us to our Milwaukee High School Outstanding Student Award. So, Principal Gilman. Good evening, everybody, council members, mayor. Good evening. Um, um, I'm excited to introduce Elijah Otero tonight to you. And uh, one of the things I want to say is when you open up Webster's Dictionary and you look up courageous, you look up resiliency, you look up kind, you look up all of those types of words, you're going to see a picture of Elijah in there. <laughs> and, um, and so he, as we were talking earlier before we started, we um, talked about the play that he was in this last week and was fabulous, amazing. But other things too, just every time I've asked Elijah to do something, he'll step up, even though he really doesn't, we didn't have a strong relationship before, but he was there. I don't know if you remember um, Mr. Gambo when he was at the grand opening. So he was our keynote speaker, student speaker also. <laughs> and just is just a really tremendous young person who's gone through some things and just comes out just um, shining, just very strong and kind. And I'm just really impressed with him. But today I'm gonna read some things that people said about you. Just a couple folks that I wanted to read to you. Um, So Elijah was a student in my world and U.S. history class, and there they cons 
consistently showed empathy and kindness. They also have a great sense of humor. I always enjoyed their sparkly personality, personality in class. I taught Eli, I thought Eli was amazing, amazingly charming as Puck in the MHS Ma production of A Midsummer's Night Dream. Mrs. Battistel. <laughs> so Elijah is a great pick for student of the month. As someone who has worked with a lot of students who have faced familiar, familiar, uh, similar challenges, I am extremely impressed with what Elijah has been able to overcome and accomplish on his own. It's my job to connect students who are on their own to community resources, but by the time I met Elijah, he had already connected himself to everything. He displays thoughtfulness, caring, concern, and a desire to assist his fellow students. He is an asset to his school community and will bring a great deal to whatever he chooses to pursue post high school. Thank you for honoring him. He deserves it. Katie Ray. So I have had the pleasure of working with Elijah since the beginning of his freshman year and watching him grow into the wonderful young man he is today. Eli has always been put together. In terms of deportment, commitment, professionalism, peer relationships, and presentation. It wasn't until his sophomore year that I became aware of all the challenges and roadblocks that he faced in his home life because Eli always gets the job done and done well. And also partly because Eli has taught himself to be totally self-sufficient. COVID turned all of our lives upside down, but what it allowed Elijah to do was to call a halt many of his life practices, take some time to reassess the situation and make a plan to launch himself, partly due to the generosity of a family in the community that took him in and provided him with a secure place to stay. It was during this time that Eli set out his plan to emancipate himself, which you all know is not an easy task. I remember last summer when Eli called me to let me know that he was an adult at 17, meaning that he had achieved emancipation, secured an apartment, and took charge of his own life and destiny. In school, I have watched Eli grow from a freshman in beginning drama and fine arts lab classes through COVID and CDL and into his senior year. I'm blessed of, to have had Eli as a TA for one of my beginning drama classes this year where he has garnered so much respect from the class that he is viewed by the students as not a student, but almost a peer teacher. I also get to work with Eli in my senior advanced college credit English class, where he regularly contributes to the class discussions, engages in strong questioning and explorations of subject matter and consistently produces work of a very high caliber. I don't want to forget to point out that Eli is also a regular participant in our extracurricular theater program as an active thespian, a student director, a technician, and an actor, all while maintaining high grades, straight A's by the way, um, holding down a job and taking care of life as an independent adult while still a full-time student. I'm absolutely thrilled that little Elijah Otero is being recognized as April's student of the month, Mr. Walker. Thank you. Thank you for just being so amazing and for contributing so much to our community and for being so resilient and going and advocating for yourself and just being able to stay kind through all of it. And just, it's so important. And I know that in your future, that's something that you want to continue to do and give back to folks. And um, like you and I talked about, just having that empathy and that understanding, I think is so powerful. And so just thank you for everything you do. I'm very proud to be your principal and to call you mine, <laughs> Elijah. Wonderful. So, um, tell us a little bit about what your what your plans are after after you graduate. Uh, after after graduation, I'm intending to go to Portland uh, Community College, and then after two years, transfer up to probably Oregon State or University of Oregon. Uh, studying psychology and minoring in theater because uh, both of them I have a lot of interest in. Yeah. <laughs> nice. What um, Do you have specific thoughts about what you want to do with uh, psych psychological training? With, with psychology, I probably, my just general thought is becoming uh, just a clinical practitioner because there are a lot of people that just need help understanding themselves more than anything like understanding is is something that is most important with helping like find 
solutions to your answers or processing them. <laughs> and a lot of people, if they don't do that, they can just break themselves down to an unhealthy degree. So yeah. <laughs> That's wonderful. It's really important. I think it's, uh, and Oregon sadly is, um, suffers from that. We, uh, we rank pretty poorly nation, nationwide on mental health care. So we need lots of amazing young people like you to pick up that torch. Thank you. So I will. I'll go. I have a question. Congratulations, Elijah. <laughs> Thank um, you. Could you describe in four words, and you can explain why you chose those four words, your four years at Milwaukee? Tough, exhilarating, exciting, and mysterious. Uh, I'd say mysterious is just going into every year, there was something, something weird. Freshman year, it was uh, being in pods instead of having a normal school building. Sophomore year, straight through the middle, COVID hit, and that was junior year, it was throughout, and then senior year, it's like I'm back in school. Uh, I'd say all throughout, it's been exciting because learning learning is so integral. It's so fun if, if you really just enjoy the subject. Uh, tough because you always have to put a foot forward to get all of the work done because <laughs> nothing gets done if someone doesn't put effort into it. and. I'm not, I don't remember the last word I said. Mysterious. Exhilarating. It's exhilarating. exhilarating. <laughs> yeah, exhilarating is all of the, the exciting moments, like, like performing as a theater performer, uh, like building up to that, it gets really nerve wracking and nerve wracking. And then once you're up there, you, you put everything you've worked for up forward and you're like, this is what it's about. It's fruits of my labor. So yeah. That's high school. It's <laughs> <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> <Thank you. laughs> great. Nice job, Desi. <laughs> Who wants to go? I can. I can go. Um, it's so nice to see you in person too. Thank you for coming here and joining us. Um, it's been a while since we've gotten to do this in, in um, face to face. Um, you are, You have done a lot already in four years, and I would be tired if I were you. <laughs> um, so kudos to you for continuing to have the enthusiasm that, that you just exhibited for, for what you're doing. Um, you know, you. You've taken on a lot, and you haven't had a choice about taking some of that on, and you still seem to excel and um, and be a part of the community and bring a real grace to, to just being who you are. So that's, that's a real gift. Um, and I, um, I love that you have the psychology and theater combination. I think it's a really good one. <laughs> I'm curious what sort of connections you see between the two. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. It's so weird. It's, it's, like, it's like the understanding between you, you see entertainment and you're like, I want I want a connection with these these people, I guess. And there's so much about learning that's you you learn to understand people because you see something in yourself and that's that's what makes like a good connection between two. So it's weird. Psychology and theater, they just kind of work together yeah. for me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sounds. Yeah, and it is about connection. Well, I'm glad that you'll stay in the area for a couple years, and you know, I hope I see you in some future productions around town. That would be really great. Congratulations, and thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're really impressive, and I'm sorry you've had to go through what you've had to go through. But, um, and the, that Counselor Heisey took my question. Uh, <laughs> I didn't say anything. <laughs> Because that was my thought, was I never thought about theater and psychology, but there is a lot of connection between it. And I know there are some psychologists who use 
play acting role play as a as a method and thing. So that's really interesting that that you're into both of them and. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry I didn't get over there to see Midsummer Night's Dream. It sounds like it was great. Um, uh, I guess um, I will just ask a very mundane question, which is um, most of what you listed you is performance, but uh, the principal mentioned that you're also doing the behind the directing and behind the scenes and stuff. Can you talk a little bit about the difference and which you prefer? And yeah, yeah. Uh, so last semester, I'll just give the example. I directed a, a little one-act show. It was 30 minutes. And it was it's such a big shift between being just your, your one character, between balancing all of these people and helping them reach their fullest. I being being a leader like that and like a director of talent it's like i learned i learned so much about the individual you have to you have to give them space enough for them to grow on their own but you also have to give them the push in the direction that you want and it's such a it's such a sharp thing between stepping on that creative the creative drive because you want them to flourish like a flower and you gotta water them just right. It's mm -hmm. yeah, directing is mm -hmm. really fun. It's really yeah. fun. I love acting too, though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Great. Well, it sounded like a principal there for just a second. <laughs> <laughs> he also, even though he directed a thirty-minute act, mm -hmm. his teacher told me that he basically teaches the drama one class. Uh, oh, yeah. That's my question. <laughs> I noticed that too. You, you're teaching. That's. Tell us about that. That's so cool. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, it was it was weird. Beginning of the year, I'm like, hmm, I don't have space in my schedule for advanced drama. What if I teach a beginning drama class? <laughs> so I, I went to I went to my drama director. I'm like, Scott A. Walker, can I TA for you? <laughs> and and I, I started TAing and. Uh, you know, he, he just gave me the opportunity to teach them. He, he like he gave me what we're doing in classes, and we kind of work together. And then he's like, whenever the students are kind of working on their own thing, I can I can really go around connect with them on an individual level because it's stuff that I know. And then teaching's really fun. I was like, I never thought teaching was for me, but. But helping helping them learn learn something that I'm familiar with, they could just they could really uh, they can have a good time, and I can help someone get further than than they could be without me. It's it's crazy <laughs> teaching. <laughs> you are you're remarkable, and you are clearly an advocate for yourself. I mean, you know volunteering to, I mean, suggesting that you would teach, help teach <laughs> a high school class never would have occurred to me. <laughs> so it's, I mean, just, and throughout, I mean, you know, I mean, clearly you've, you've learned some skills that are going to serve you so well in the future. And I'm really excited to, to see you do that and to implement, I mean, and to help others and to help teacher, you know, tell, teach your your patients one day, you know, mm -hmm. this, some of the skills and some of the tools that you've had to rely on in your life. Um, you're just, you're a gift. I'm so glad that I got to meet you today. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, Ms. G. Mm -hmm. I just something you just said really resonated with me is that all you needed was an opportunity. That's all we, that's all of us ever need is an opportunity. And what a great way for Scott Walker to give you that <laughs> opportunity that you wanted and needed at that time. Yeah, yeah, I, I cherish every, every connection that I've made through, throughout all of high school and especially my drama teacher, Scott, he's, he's given me so much opportunity and just, I've learned so much just being able to be associated with him and just learning everything I could. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> well, I, I was privileged to get to see your closing night performance. Um, he he was an extraordinary puck. I can tell you that. Um, 
and our was it the last was August our last one mm -hmm. or was she two ago that was two ago August so so our former student of the month was the director who not only directed it magnificently but she had to step in and play one of the parts because one of her actresses couldn't couldn't make it couldn't do it and she I, I expected some jitters in there and she just played it perfectly it was super impressive and I think you know you're you're clearly recognizing that doing the work of directing informs you as an actor and being an actor informs you as a director and makes you better at both yeah, I would absolutely say that. and uh, it was it was clear that you have real skill in in that realm um, and based on your life story I am absolutely certain you will be a very skillful therapist um, and we really need it so thank you for <clears throat> being willing to give like that and for being an amazing young young person all right the city of milwaukee is proud to recognize for outstanding student achievement in academics civic engagement and extracurricular activities at milwaukee high school elijah otero let it be known to all that on this 19th day of april 2022 the city council of the city of milwaukee and municipal corporation in the county of clackamas in the state of oregon recognize this student as an excellent example of the bright future of this community and nation school updates <laughs> okay um, well obviously we just had a play which was really nice um, because we've had some other things happening this year with the one acts and things like that but to f see a full-on play um, student directed was for me a treat um, we had I was telling um, Desi that we had a barbecue not that long ago because it was sunny in between the snow and the rain um, <laughs> somewhere in there but um, and it was really cute we just did like hot dogs, Costco dogs, and then like some, we had some vegan dogs and stuff like that and chips and water and we put music out there and we were all dancing and it was really cute, especially our ninth and 10th graders. They're like, what is this? What's going on? <laughs> we're barbecuing. And they're like, for what? I go, cause we're, we're creating community. We're creating opportunity, you know? And then they were like, oh, and it was just so sweet to watch them and, um, and, the, and then we had the whole uh, thing with the mask mandates, like some people not wearing masks, others wearing them. But in my experience, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like everyone's been very respectful to one another and, um, and what their choices are, which is really, um, I know for me, a really proud moment because at first we were worried about what's going to happen or, you know, how are people going to react? And we had, um, and our, just every been, everyone's been great from what I can tell. So do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say absolutely. Okay, um, you can call me out if there, you want. No, there's not been there's not been a lot of like disagreements. It's been really positive, at least. Yeah, from what I've seen. Yeah. So, and then we were just doing like now we're that we're able to do things. You know, we're planning our regular events. A lot of our seniors, especially, have felt like they've lost out on a lot of experiences throughout high school, and I can totally see that. And. So uh, we're excited about just different events that are coming up. We're gonna have our, obviously our prom, we get to have prom this year. Um, we're adding another dance for the younger kiddos that don't get to do that. So we're gonna do that. Um, we have an assembly on the 29th, which is a lip sync, but we also have some other groups. Um, 
So our Asian Pacific Islander Club, they're gonna dance and we've been trying to get them to dance for like three years, but we finally like have built those relationships and that trust and so that's really exciting. Um, and you know, I think now that we're able to come together more, it's allowing us to create more community. So we're gonna throw another barbecue in there. We have a pride party coming up on June 3rd, which is gonna be bigger than any of the ones we've had. Um, so lots of kids working on that. And then, um, Academically, we are introducing pre-AP for all ninth graders next year. Um, we're moving down some college and career readiness courses for our ninth graders so that they have study hall one semester, college and career the second semester, then they get it again as juniors. Um, we have more students that have taken the STAMP test than this year than in the history of Milwaukee. Um, so we'll have uh, probably about 33 students that will be have their seal by literacy in multiple languages. So we're very excited about that. Um, and then graduation this year is going to be at Providence Park again. So uh, that's exciting. And um, yeah, just trying to do some things with the kids and just to give them some of those experiences back because it's been, it's been hard, so. And you can kind of feel the lift a little bit with now that we're able to come together. You can you can feel the energy shifting some and kids coming and creating more community. It's been hard for our kids to be isolated for so long and you know not being able to socialize or those things. It's been really tough. So, how are you talking about that? I mean, is because it's I feel like we have this unaddressed trauma in all all different places in society and I'm just wondering what conversations you're having about that at the high school. It is, un there is a lot of unaddressed trauma and I think that when our students came back it was very clear um, and I think those conversations have been taking place a lot with like our district and at the high school. I have a student advisory committee and they brought that up. Um, just about like the trauma and how there's a lot of anxiety and depression and not having as many resources and supports as our students need and that's still true. Um, so it's been a very heavy lift because we try to like meet kids where they're at, like what do you need and get those resources. And so the, that dialogue going on with like district and like diff and, then, and then our building, but also just there's things that I saw this year that I hadn't seen um, a lot of in the past because we were able to like create some community and get some some momentum and traction and I felt like we went backwards a little bit. Um, so we've been having a lot of conversations with different student groups and different things like that around like issues of racism or homophobia or even just sexism, right? Like and kids and so we've had a couple sessions where if you want to drop in in the community room we're just dialoguing about the culture of our campus and a lot of kids they i think want to have these conversations but they don't know how to have them and so when they're with their peers even though they're feeling that way with their peers they'll just go along with what's happening to be to not isolate themselves but when you open up the conversation and kids show up and it's been very interesting where we might have some students from ma and some from mhs and just like the dialogue that's happening between them was really powerful for me to listen to because they all want the same thing which is they want to feel seen they want to feel heard they want to have the supports they need and they don't want and they want to be safe right like so those conversations have been little um as much as we could because we had all these you couldn't, you can't meet, you can't this, you can't. But now we're, and then we, um, I ended up having a ninth grade assembly um, to talk about just kind of like how things were going and, uh, you know, uh, social media has been really, has really impacted our community as well and teaching kiddos about like positive social media. And, and it's mostly our, our younger kids, um, our ninth and 10th graders who were the ones that weren't, they were so young when, when we went into lockdown, you know, and our juniors and seniors, I think what I see with them is more of this kind of like, uh, I just want to get through the year, you know, like kind of let's get this over with, um, with a lot of them, but with our younger ones, it's more about just knowing how to navigate technology, how to have difficult, courageous conversations, how to talk about uh, tough subjects without, in a respectful way, right? So. 
but teachers are doing it. I've, I've gone into classrooms a lot where teachers are talking about it. They have whole lesson plans where they're addressing issues of inequities and just how to treat one another and that kind of thing. So lots of conversations happening within the classroom and then outside of the classroom. And then we have some support staff that, um, like if you come down in our main office or any of our offices, we all have snacks. Like I have snacks in my office. Kids come in all the time. You want a snack? Go ahead, get some drinks. That, you know, that good drinks. Like not, not, <laughs> not alcoholic drinks. <laughs> Anyway, but yeah, some like, and the kids just, you know, they, they need that. So they, and it's allowed us to build these relationships and they just need that. So, so we're talking about it in different pockets and different things like that. Wow. So, yeah. Thank you mm -hmm. for doing that. Thank you. You are, you are the right principal for this time. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. That's about it. You want to add anything? Uh, well, it's it's weird talking talking about the the like the grade gap because some students went from like seventh grade to freshman year. Yeah, mm -hmm. crazy jump for those kids in like maturity level and a lot of things. But I I definitely feel it's been a lot different than at the beginning of the year to right now. Uh, like this late in the year, it seems like a lot of a lot of the students have become more comfortable, more mature. I guess naturally they had to become more mature because there's 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 teacher expectation. This is is high school for for them now. But it's it's been it's been nice seeing seeing them come into their own and expressing themselves more and becoming more comfortable as freshmen rather than eighth graders or something of the sort. And it's gotten better. It's yeah. it's most certainly gotten better. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. Yep, I feel Very the good. same way. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Congratulations again. So have Eli. a great Thank night. You so much. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's our exit time. <laughs> All right, our next item tonight is the volunteer, 2021 Volunteer of the Year Award. This will be uh, presented by our Community Engagement Coordinator, Jason Wax. Oh, there he is. Can we get, there you go. Thank you, Scott. If you need an extra chair here. All right. <laughs> Excuse my busted leg. It's all right. It's all right. What'd you do? Uh, had a little slip. Outreach. Yeah. <laughs> Outreach. I was visiting a camp and slipped in some mud and uh, no. blew out my knee. Ow. So. Ouch. Again. It's happened again. Well, good evening. Um, we're here to announce the volunteer of the year. Um, it might be pretty obvious who that is, but I thought we would at least go through a, uh, a little bit of the criteria just to kind of remind everybody kind of how we got here, um, thank all the nominees, and then um, we'll talk about our volunteers of the year. Um, so as you know, every year, uh, city council chooses a, a volunteer of the year. Uh, the criteria that, um, that we look at essentially is anyone who resides in Milwaukee or members of a nonprofit or business that serves the Milwaukee community. Um, council looked at longevity, longevity of service to the community, um, contribution of service, obviously in the year of 2021, service within the city limits of Milwaukee, and then um, also taken into consideration is uh, some contribution to a, a city-related activity like a board or a commission or an NDA, that sort of thing. Um, and last month, um, city council chose the, the winners, the winners. Um, the, but the nomination process began on December 14th and it ended on February 14th. And these are the nine nominations that we received. I didn't know if mayor, if you'd like to thank all these folks or read them or how sure, I prefer to do that. Yeah, um, so we had Zach Perry, 
And then we had Ray Bryan, Stephanie Hollingshead, Susanna Pye, Linda Carr, Samantha Swindler, Terry Grau Brindle, Neil Hankerson, and then of course our winners, Brandy and Tom Johnson. And that's the next slide. Look at that. Um, I don't think they've seen these photos that we took of them a couple weeks ago, but um, there they are. Um, so yeah, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm just gonna let you take it away if you'd like to just kind of tell folks what, what they do. Well, actually, it would be better if they told us oh, what well, they that, do. That, we could do that as well. We could do that as well. I didn't have a major script here for this. We're just, um, but yeah. So tell, tell, this is your opportunity to tell the wider community about your program, because I think it's a really important thing that you guys do, and I think it makes a big difference, and a lot of people don't know about it. So not that there's zillions of people that watch our meetings, but <laughs> no, I'm afraid, afraid not. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for the recognition. We uh, we really appreciate it, and um, I'll let Brandy do most of the talking. But I w I wanted to say that it's not just us; it's our our team. Um, we have a phenomenal team of volunteers that backs everything we do. Um, not just volunteers, but other. Uh, behind the scenes supporters and we often um, call ourselves kindness brokers because we're really, we're, we're uh, connecting um, the people who want to do good in our community uh, with the people who need to be the recipients of that, that good doing. <laughs> um, and we're just the conduit for that and we're, we're incredibly blessed to be so. Like uh, we, we love doing that. And I'll let Brandy tell you a little more specifically about what we do. Uh, so we provide free laundry in the community, uh, Oregon City and Milwaukee. Um, we, there's two locations in Milwaukee right now, so three times a month. Um, and what we have discovered with free laundry is that um, a lot of folks have to choose between food and housing and transportation or clean clothes. And that directly impacts school attendance significantly, um, as well as access to employment and maintaining employment um, and just general health and hygiene implications. Um, what we saw with the pandemic was the closure of public restrooms and uh, lack of access to soap and hot water. Uh, we are seeing instances of bed bugs and infections and infestations like we had never seen before. Um, and so out of our laundry outreach with hygiene, we also provide, um, folks can come and shop for whatever they need. So we, we don't really do prepackaged hygiene kits. We let folks come and shop. They figure out what they need and we have volunteers who help them with that. So shampoo, I mean, any of the hygiene stuff or, or if we don't have something and someone asks, we like to always check in and find out like, how is this meeting needs? What are we missing? You know, what's not helpful, what's helpful? Um, so with the closure of the public bathrooms, that's when we started borrowing Clackam the service center's shower cart um, and providing showers. I, I, I started by asking for just hand washing stations, but that was uh, too much because they couldn't be maintained and that just wasn't where emergency operations were at um, at the county level. And so we just decided that we would do showers because that was something we could do. Um, so we've expanded to include showers, a shower cart program, um, we also started partnering with the USDA Farm to Table Food Box Program because we were also realizing that with lack of access to uh, like even fast food or, or traditional food pantries, um, folks are really suffering in the food area already, right? Like we already know that that's a crisis level thing, but the impact of the pandemic just made it even more so, especially with uh, school closed and no access to backpack buddies and you know any of those things, the, the supports that were coming home on the weekends to get kiddos through the weekends weren't happening. Um, and so we did, I don't know, I want to say it was like 70,000 pounds of food um, while we had access to that program. Um, and so we've recently resumed food access through a, a pantry, a weekly food pantry that's out in Redlands, so a rural area. Um, but that's an area that we're uh, looking to expand to in partnership with Clackamas Service Center and their generous uh, support through providing the food items to us. Um, 
We are also looking to roll out an outreach team. So we just absolutely adore working with Chief Strait and his officers. Uh, we've responded multiple times to calls for just assistance because it's not necessarily a law enforcement issue. It's, it's a human services issue. And when we can pair with them and respond and we, we have that partnership to provide those resources, you have an incredible police department and team. I will just say that um, Officer Simak has come to my house to pick up supplies for someone he's been working with. And this person he's been building a relationship with for like over a year. Um, so it's just phenomenal to be in Milwaukee and to doing to be doing this work with you all. We were just sitting back there feeling how peaceful and encouraging and positive this is and how encouraging for us doing the work that we're doing that the kids coming out of this community are, are, are like the individual who is just recognized. That is absolutely phenomenal. So we're just, we're excited to be part of this community doing this work here with you all. Um, and we just, love our neighbors so yeah does that cover yeah. it yeah. <laughs> yeah we always need volunteers so uh and you're welcome to just drop in on any of our events. They're really fun events uh, and community-based events. They're um, attended almost wholly by people from right here in town, uh, both on the volunteer side and the people receiving services. Um, yeah, it, it takes 25 to 30 volunteers to do an event, and we consistently have 25 to 30 volunteers from this community yeah. doing this work. Nice, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then and, and about a 100, 20 to 180 yeah. uh, attendees um, beyond that. And uh, I think I think Brandy touched on that we do laundry, but I just wanted uh, to make everybody aware that those are there are far more than just laundry at those events. They are an entire service mall. People mm -hmm. receive lots of services. They have access to anything they would normally find in, that you would normally find in your medicine cabinet or pantry, in addition to mm -hmm. the supports that our organization provides and many of our partner organizations that come to those events with us. Yeah. Um, so uh, Cascade AIDS Project, um, Outside In, mm -hmm. um, Oregon Health Authority. Probably uh, Bob. Providence's uh, Bob Outreach, um, OHP, or yeah, OHP, and um, AA has been there too. AA, mm -hmm. uh, Milwaukee Lutheran. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Stephanie Hollingshead, yep. who was on that list, yep. um, her and her team uh, regularly visit our events and continue to support us. Um, so it's a community effort, and we really appreciate those that are on the on the trail with us. So that's awesome. Maybe we can. I don't know if. I haven't ever noticed it. Do we do we mention this monthly in the pilot? Um, I don't think we mentioned it in the pilot, Jason. I don't know if has it gone out in NDA updates at all. Let's um, let's if we could oh, no. if we could get a little blurb in the pilot every month. I think that would be helpful for calling for volunteers and then whatever else. And then my curiosity is, what are the things? that you need from the government level, whether it's us or the county or the state, what, what are the, what, what would make a big difference? That's a good question. Uh, immediately what comes to mind is financial support to roll out this outreach team so that we can be more responsive in those situations like when Walt's camping on the waterfront with his dog. <laughs> um, but donations are always hugely helpful. So hygiene supplies, outdoor gear, you know, while we're working to move people indoors, um, that's a concerted effort working with Metro and ODOT and the housing authority and all of those folks. But in the interim, it's really helpful to have those relief items. Um, you know, wintertime, it's hand warmers. It's just, we go through so many supplies at our events. We fill our entire van and it's completely depleted by the end of the night. Um, so just the sheer amount of stuff that we're going through, those sorts of supplies, or I mean, even connections to maybe wholesale, you know, people know people, right? So connections to wholesalers or things like that where we can better, better have better resources to, to secure those items, things like that. Um, 
Yeah. Those relationships are our most valuable asset uh, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, we connect a lot of dots. So anybody who's interested in what we're doing and wants to reach out to us to mm -hmm. see what it's about and see what they can bring to the table, we would love to make those connections and, and build those relationships. Yeah, and if there's an organization or a group doing work that you think would make a good pair, send them our way. Like we had a, a lady come out. She does um, like in-home gardening on decks it's a I don't remember the name of the project but she's really wanting to connect with families um, particularly like low income and teach them how to grow things in the small spaces that they have and that was beautiful the night she came out she just engaged with folks and connected resources and you know that makes a big difference for a family uh, especially teaching kids how to grow food so yeah, food that security was, you know having yeah. something right on yeah. your porch yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll underpin the financial side of things with um, with volunteers. We are from well, from government that you asked. So those relationships. That's what I would mostly say that we're looking for is those um, be be uh, engage with us, hear what's going on on the street, and um, and then take that to your job. Do you? Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to. If you, I mean, if you, I mean, I think it was a great question but you might also think about things or you might con be confronted by barriers, mm -hmm. you know, that, that maybe you're not thinking about right now, but I hope that you would feel very comfortable reaching out to any of us um, if you do come across something that you said, oh, you know what, actually city of Milwaukee, you can make this change and that would make our lives a lot easier. I think that you'd have Thank you. a pretty willing audience. You all have already done that with just allowing us to operate the shower cart. We thought we'd have to jump through hoops and do all the things, and it was like, nope, go for it. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah, night and day difference. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> cool. Good. Well, yeah. Um, and so, do you have a website? We do. Right up there. I know. I'm yeah, lovelonecommunity.org. <laughs> for discussion. Oh. So that, uh, lovelonecommunity.org is our website. Um, uh, the website has our schedule of events. Uh, anybody can go there and see what's going on at a given time. Um, but the best thing on there is uh, the recaps of our events and the connection to our yeah. uh, Facebook communities and stories there. Mm -hmm. um, Brandy does an incredible job of uh, um, really capturing the the flavor and the spirit uh, of the events and and the heartwarming things that happen on a weekly basis for us because um, those are the that's the real impact is you know we might be bring, giving somebody a toothbrush well that's clean teeth but like the impact on people's lives and hearts and, and, and minds and, and the relationships built out of those things are the real impact. And she articulates those in such a phenomenal way uh, through those stories. Um, check those out. If you want something to really brighten your day, go check out a couple of those stories. They're amazing. Cool. Yeah. As a teacher, when a kid is chronically has dirty clothes, mm -hmm. they experience so many horrible things mm -hmm. yeah. and when they come in with clean clothes it changes everything for a kid mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like they know they can learn they know they're part of this community so when you're giving those kids clean, I, i've seen it i feel like there's only so much a teacher can do mm -hmm. you know i can't offer to take their clothes home and wash them but just having kids be able to come into school with clean clothes it changes lives. Mm -hmm. It changes lives. So thank you for doing that. Thank you for being in our community, and thank you for <coughs> highlighting that you know that we're neighbors, mm -hmm. and, and you know you're serving this this community. You're serving Milwaukeeans, you know, and and the, the, you're so needed, and you're so welcome here. So thank you very mm -hmm. much. And I'm so touched by. I mean, we've watched you grow so fast. Um, so just the fact that you saw a need and you keep seeing needs and you keep figuring out how to meet more needs is really a generous gift because I think for most people, just you know, paying for the cost of laundry would feel like it was enough. And it hasn't been enough for you guys. So, so thank you. It's a good lesson for all of us, you know. It's easy to feel overwhelmed and like there's too much and to do nothing. Mm -hmm. And you have really been such great examples of how, how false that story is and how easy it is 
that that the energy is there, that the people are there, that you're not doing it alone. Once once you provide that vision, so thank you. Yeah. Uh, can uh, can I just follow it up? You mentioned um, uh, the vision and the growth. Um, uh, I think. Uh, as, as with many, as with generations of anything, uh, we stand on the shoulders of giants, right? And um, for us, um, excuse me, <clears throat> this organization was started by our friend Dave uh, McAdams, who um, was born and raised here in Milwaukee, um, longtime friend of ours who passed away a couple of years ago. Um, but it was really his vision, or he birthed you know, the, the, this organization um, with just an incredible love for his neighbors and community. And um, we're so grateful to just be a part of that. And uh, um, just to see it grow, he'd be like super, super stoked to see, uh, you know, what's, what's happening today. He, he was a truly great man. He, we, we got him in before council once, I forget how long ago, just to talk about the program a little bit to try and yeah. generate some, just an amazing guy. Yeah, really phenomenal dude. Yeah. You guys really just put something, put my privilege in check, because we don't ever have to worry about, make a choice between dinner, you know, rent, doing laundry, buying groceries. Our, our privilege is we can just get up and go, mm -hmm. you know. And really, like, I, I, as I sit here, I just think about how lucky I am that I get to go home to a, a house and I can do laundry whenever I want and I can let it sit in the washing machine. <laughs> yeah. You know? and, yeah. And it's all stinky, but you know what I mean? Why it yells at you. <laughs> yeah. And then you can wash it again for free. Yes. <laughs> I can continue to do that over yeah. and over and yeah. over again. And so many people yeah. don't have that, right? Yeah. So thanks for putting my privilege in check. Thank I you. think part of what keeps initially kept bringing us back was the first night we volunteered with Dave. Uh, this, this gentleman came in and wasn't making eye contact, dirty clothes. He got his laundry done. He went to leave with clean clothes and a bag of clean clothes. And he made eye contact and he said, thanks for not treating me like trash. Ooh. I thought that was really powerful. Like it wasn't even, hey, thanks for the free laundry. It was just thanks for not treating me like garbage. And we've had we've had moms. That's a really low bar, guys. Yeah. yeah. We've had moms with their kids ride the bus, knowing that they're going to be at the laundromat till ten o'clock, finishing their laundry with little kiddos. But the kiddos are dancing because we get to wear clean clothes tomorrow. I mean, I've heard that come out of their mouths. L literally, before. those and words. My kids are excited about candy yeah. to that point. You know, not clean clothes. They just take that for granted. Yeah. 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 The impact's real. It's good. Yeah. yeah. And the, the um, you mentioned us uh, uh, being neighbors or calling mm -hmm. calling out our neighbors. Uh, that's been a, the semantics of that, the, the, the changing the way we talk about um, people in need in our community has been something we've very, um, done very intentionally. Mm -hmm. um, and, and using that word neighbor is very inclusive um, rather than exclusive or defining. Um, it's, it brings somebody into the fold rather than you know, separating them from ourselves. And um, uh, I really encourage you guys to, <laughs> to adopt that, use that when we're talking about um, any, any group that would otherwise be marginalized by language. Um, bring them in, call them neighbors because that's what they are. Yep. Yeah. Do you guys want to do pictures with the council? Just so everybody knows, we will be celebrating them at our volunteer dinner in July as well. Um, so this isn't the end of the thank you. Um, they'll also be featured in uh, an upcoming issue of the pilot. And uh, yeah, we'll see you in July as well. Cool. So. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Do you want to do a picture? Sure. Yeah, where are we going? Nice stuff. It's the best place to do this. We haven't done this in a while. 
generally do it. Right here? Yeah. Just tell me where to hobble. I'm not calling you that, right? There we go. Very good cut. Yeah, it's nice. Everybody suck it in. I'm wearing a lipstick pants. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the rest. Thank you for inviting us. Absolutely. Ah, oh, man. <clears throat> oh, so he did have a script. Yeah, you didn't read that. I hadn't turned the page. <laughs> All right. Natalie. Uh, our Earth Day proclamation, which will be presented by our Climate and Natural Resources Manager, Natalie Rogers. Hi, everyone. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. So my name is Natalie Rogers, and I'm the Climate and Natural Resources Manager for the City of Milwaukee. I'm here tonight in recognition of Earth Day, celebrated across the globe and in Milwaukee on April 22nd. When we think of Earth Day, we think of volunteerism and appreciation of the environment. We think of picking up garbage, going for a walk in the sun, helping plant some trees, or making aesthetic improvements in the community. These are all amazing things that not only help our families, but also our community feel connected to the nature around us. Milwaukee has a variety of great Earth Day activities coming up this week, including a restoration event on Saturday, April 23rd from 9 to 11 a.m. at the Willow Place Natural Area in the Lake Road neighborhood, where we'll be improving a significant green space in South Milwaukee, which provides critical habitat and is one of the last heavily canopied spaces in the city. This event will be followed by a permaculture class held at the site from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. to share with the community the practice of balancing land management with sustainability. Information about this event can be found on the city calendar along with other Earth Day celebrations being held across Milwaukee. These events are fantastic ways to get out and contribute to the community and our natural spaces, and I hope you can join us for them. That said, Earth Day is about more than just volunteerism, and it's important to recognize and discuss its foundation to understand its significance. The first Earth Day was held in 1970. It wasn't a celebration. Instead, it was a movement centered around protest and demand for action at the government level. Rivers were catching on fire. Wildlife was disappearing from excessive use of toxic pesticides and uncontrolled pollution was occurring in waterways, air, and soil, transforming those ecosystems and the land around them and jeopardizing the health of surrounding communities. Seeing the dramatic change and loss of the natural world due to unmanaged resource exploitation, industrialization, and urbanization shook communities at their core and made them fear what would be left for current and future generations. In response, environmentalists, academics, students, community members, neighbors, families, and friends rallied around the message of action, demanding change and accountability for the environmental degradation that became all too common in our nation. Soon after the first Earth Day, the United States federal government formed the Environmental Protection Agency and established legislation while, while not perfect, allowed for the monitoring and regulation of critical habitats and species, water, air, and land. The first Earth Day protests set the foundation for environmental movements to come, and in many ways, we still benefit from their work. But like many origin stories and practices which change in time, the Earth Day we celebrate today at the messaging we share is not the same as the first Earth Day 1970. At that moment, they were mourning the environment they were losing, while today, we are celebrating the one we have. However, some community members are still calling for remembrance of the original purpose of Earth Day and demanding for governments like ours to act once again against the great environmental threat that is climate change. To speak frankly, the changing climate is going to alter our landscape as we know it. Our current ecosystem, a delicate balance of nutrients, temperature, seasonality, and species diversity is being altered at its core by the resulting consequences of the lifestyles we all live, the societal norms we have all grown to custom to. More than ever, we need to be the sounding the alarm, shaking up the way we act, the things we do, the rules and regulations that we live by. 
We need immediate actions and swift decisions to prepare us and hopefully protect the many lives of plants, wildlife, and organisms that also call Milwaukee home. I know that the Milwaukee community and council see this need for action. We have a great climate action plan, an urban forest management plan, as well as a comprehensive plan that lays out principles and policies to slow and prepare for a changing climate. But we also need immediate action, just like in 1970 on that first Earth Day. I'm so happy to be here today and present this proclamation on a day where council is considering a private tree code written to protect and preserve some of the most critical and most jeopardized green infrastructure that provides known and proven climate adaptation and mitigation benefits. Actions like implementable code and resulting programs are the steps we need and the actions the community deserves to protect the Milwaukee environment. I'm proud of the work our community does and the love our community has for Milwaukee's trees, streams, wetlands, wildlife, rivers, and all the features that make Milwaukee so beautiful and charismatic. For what is Milwaukee without a bay to read a book by, a canopy trolley trail to bike down, a Minthorn wetland to stroll through, and a flock of healthy Canada geese to block traffic? <laughs> for these reasons and more, Milwaukee celebrates Earth Day both as a declaration of love and appreciation for the environment we live in, as well as a movement, a demand a call to protect it. I hope to see you all and others at our upcoming restoration event, and I appreciate the work this council does and the community does for the Milwaukee environment. Thank you. Thank you. You are a big part of all of the solutions that we're doing, both you and Peter. Thank you both. Man, this is going to be just a night of crying. <laughs> Happy birthday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about your party. <laughs> <sighs> Whereas the people of this city, the Dogwood City of the West, are proud to reside amid natural beauty of the Pacific Northwest and the state of Oregon, and all the trees, plants, waterways, and wildlife encompassed in this region that give character and life to the landscape. And whereas the first Earth Day was proclaimed on April 22, 1970, and its annual observance has encouraged the con uh, conservation, protection, and appreciation of our planet's ecosystems and natural resources through environmental volunteerism and climate action. And whereas the Milwaukee community has embraced carbon and sustainability goals, goals in the face of climate change, the most pressing threat for our planet, and whereas the city of Milwaukee has adopted a climate action plan, urban forest management plan, and comprehensive plan that includes strategies and policies that will enable our city to conserve natural resources, promote a healthy urban forest, encourage sustainable behaviors, and improve community and environmental resiliency. And whereas the city of Milwaukee declared a climate emergency on January 21st, 2020, and called for the acceleration of the climate goals established in the Climate Action Plan to address the urgency of the climate crisis and call on community members to take part in the climate action, in climate action on their, in their own homes, businesses, and communities. And whereas education, partnerships, and community actions for restoring and protecting our ecosystems, climate, and planet are promoted and honored by all Milwaukee residents, as is the shared desire for a resilient community, environmental justice, and access to nature for all community members. And whereas the city of Milwaukee proudly recognizes all who protect and preserve the environment and climate through participation in Earth Day activities by taking a proactive role in the protection of our community's precious natural resources. Now, therefore, I'm Mark Gamba, mayor of the city of Milwaukee, a municipal corporation in the county of Clackamas in the state of Oregon, to hereby proclaim April, 20, April 22nd, 2022, Earth Day. Thank you. Thanks. All right, community comments. This is the part of the agenda during which council will hear community members' statements regarding city business. Those wishing to speak, please submit a yellow comment card if you are in City Hall or email ocr at milwaukeeoregon.gov. Raise your hand in Zoom or write a comment in the Zoom chat to indicate you wish to speak. If you are calling in through Zoom and would like to make a comment, dial star nine to raise your hand. Before you make your comments, please state your name and city of residence for the record. 
If you would like the city to follow up with you, please submit your contact information to OCR at MilwaukeeOregon.gov. As council has other business items on the agenda this evening, speakers will be limited to three minutes each. Because the information provided during the community comments may be new to the may be new, the city manager will respond at the next council meeting to those comments that require follow-up. Before we begin, is there any follow-up from the April 5th community comments? I do have some follow-up too. Uh, so the first was uh, Rod Smith came in and provided testimony uh, expressing frustration about the removal from some trees uh, near City Hall. Um, those comments were um, partially responded to at the meeting by um, our Public Works Director, Peter Passarelli um, and Natalie Rogers. Um, uh, Anne would like, she's out of town this week and she actually would like to personally respond to that. So she asked that I let everyone know that um, she will respond at the May 3rd meeting more completely to those remarks. Uh, the other person that commented was Phil Moen. Uh, he's a Milwaukee resident who expressed concern um, about the bulbouts, the concrete bulbouts that have been installed as a part of the 42nd project. Uh, personally, I just want to thank him for taking the time to come in and uh, bring our attention to his safety. He was worried about safety concerns, that folks might hit those, that there was not enough light. Um, and so uh, at the time he raised those issues, we had a single um, candlestick style traffic cone installed at the end of the bump out. And we also had temporary traffic markings to realign the center line. Um, after that, this week we have uh, installed reflective tabs on the center line. We've installed reflective tabs on the top of the curb. We've also added additional traffic cones and markers uh, guiding traffic around the bulb out um, more uh, in a more visible way. Uh, we've also moved, we had large road narrows and uh, warning signs that we have moved closer to the concrete bulb out. Um, hopefully again, bringing more attention to that. Uh, once the project is complete, we are gonna have permanent striping. So the weather has not been our friend, uh, unfortunately. Um, so if we can get some dry weather, we are gonna be putting out the permanent striping, which will permanently re realign that center line. So it'll be easier to see. You'll also have the white edge lines on the outside of the lane that'll help guide the traffic away from the bump. Um, and then we're gonna maintain those reflective, but the permanent reflective markers on the curb and the fog line. So um, thank you, uh, uh, Phil, for, for coming in and talk to us. We really do appreciate it, and we appreciate everyone's vigilance. Um, and also thank you for everyone's patience as we continue to modify our roadways to add in more uh, sidewalk infrastructure and active transportation infrastructure as we go. And that's it. All right, thank you, Ms. Brooks. Um, so I have, have one. at least just this one. This is for tree. Okay. Uh, so Ms. Kieran Daspala, please. My name is Kiran Das Bala, and my address is 9725 Southeast 29th Avenue, Milwaukee, Oregon, 97222. The reason I want to talk, uh, uh, in 2009, I rented a car from Enterprises, and uh, I took it for one week, and. I was done with whatever I was renting it for in five days. So I drove back to Portland, Oregon. And then I returned, went to return it. And they said, no, you have to take it back in your home and I will come and get it tomorrow. So they came and take it. The guy who took it, his name was Vic. I don't know his last name. And I went to find out that they cannot find his name anymore. And then he turned around and did something wrong to the, you know, my returning the way I returned it. And he opened a business called Voice. It's on TV, on NBC. And he used all those money and things like laundromat kind of thing, he did it. In other words, he might have said, I didn't return the car, and I did return. They came to pick it up at my home. 
and their name was Enterprises. The, yeah, they, and I went to return the Enterprises address was 18, 18451 South McLaughlin Boulevard, Milwaukee, Oregon, 97267. And he took the car from my home and all that and they opened the voice, the, uh, the soul, from my, you know, mishap, which I didn't do anything, I returned the car. So if anybody hears anything, please talk to them and find out why they are lying that I did return that uh, the car was PT Cruiser and it was black one. Okay. And two people came to take the car. So Vic was with him and he was the manager in that address. So that's all I had to say. All right, thank you. Yeah, I returned the car. And that's for? That's for tree code. Tree code, yeah. okay. I see no email, Mr. Mayor, and I don't see any hands raised on Zoom. Okay. <clears throat> Actually, now I do see a hand raised. Uh, so we do have a speaker in Zoom. Anthony Allen, can you hear us? Mr. Al Allen? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, yes, I, I would like to bring to the city's attention at, at least my street, uh, and I suspect others, because I have heard the same the issue people having as the same issue. The, the city, or at least my street, isn't in compliance with the U.S. Post Office for on-street mailboxes. The, uh, the U.S. Post, Post Office, Office requires, requires that, that a, a mailbox on the street, the, street, uh, the drivers need access, access to, to driver to the, to the mailbox, mailbox in order to not get out, out of their, their trucks. trucks. That, that, that's, that's the rule. Uh, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, on several occasions, the post office has not mailed my, uh, they've not delivered my mail for the fact that there have been neighborhood cars uh, in front or, or near my mailbox. And upon asking the post office why I wasn't getting mail and thinking that I, I had every right to uh, have my mail delivered, I was told that they, it wasn't delivered because of the vehicles that were there. And the post office said that if it continued to occur, they could uh, cancel uh, delivery altogether and I would be required to get a post office box. Uh, which seems unreasonable uh, since I do have a mailbox in front of the house. So I, I would like to, the, the city to kind of address the fact that our code currently does not match the federal government's uh, mail delivery code for on-street mailboxes. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Did, we, did you get an address? Did somebody get an address? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I live in Milwaukee, and, and the, the street is 26th Avenue off of Lake Road. Okay, thanks. Mr. Allen, I don't know if we have your contact information, so if you wouldn't mind emailing that to OCR at MilwaukeeOregon.gov. OCR at MilwaukeeOregon.gov. That way staff can follow up. Okay, okay thank you very much. All right. <sighs> tonight's, we done, is that, okay. Tonight's consent agenda includes the minutes of the city council for March 15th, 2022 work session, March 15th, 2022 regular session, a resolution acting as a local contract review board authorizing the city manager to execute a contract amendment for municipal court judge services and Oregon Liquor Control Commission OLCC for the Little Blue Store at 2936 Southeast Washington Street off-premise sales. Does any member of council wish to remove any item from the consent agenda? No. I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. 
I'll move to approve the consent agenda as written. I second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And inherited passes unanimously. Community survey briefing, uh, a report. This will be given by our assistant city manager, Kelly Brooks. Hello everyone. So uh, I'm excited about tonight's presentation. So uh, every other year, every two years, we um, survey our community. And over time, we've been working to really evolve it more into kind of a, just a gut check on service levels for us. And so we ask around a broad array of topics. And uh, this year we contracted with FM3. You're gonna see uh, Miranda Everett up on the screen and she's gonna do most of the talking tonight. But one major change that I am excited to share with you all um, uh, this year we did very intentionally oversample. So 400 residents is the um, statistically valid number of folks that we need to talk to. Um, this year we worked with FM3 and, she'll, and Miranda will explain this more completely to um, uh, add an additional 100 residents to make sure that when we report out on our findings, we can break it out by demographics in a way, we're a smaller community. So if we don't do that, um, we have a harder time digging into the, the results in a way that helps inform our work and particularly given the council's focus on diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. We wanted to make sure we could do that this time. So um, where it's uh, where it's jumping out, Miranda will point that out. She's also got cross tabs uh, and can help answer questions that you have. Um, and uh, look, I didn't get the results back until because we were oversampling until about, I think, last Thursday. So you haven't seen them. This is new to you. Um, uh, but uh, we'll be sharing those more completely with you and the rest of the city and the community um, in the coming weeks. And with that, I want to hand it off to Miranda, make sure we can hear her. Hello, my name is Miranda Everett. I'm a vice president at FM3 Research. Um, will I be sharing my screen with the slides, or will you all put that up? You should share your screen. Okay. One moment. All right. Great. Great. Um, so, so what we have here are results from a uh, community survey in Milwaukee. Um, Kelly did a great job of kind of uh, describing a little bit of the purpose of the survey. Um, I will dive right in and talk about our survey methodology. So as mentioned, uh, these results are pretty hot off the presses. We were interviewing all the way up until the 11th. Um, and we're in the field for about a month to make sure we gave people ample time to participate. Um, this was used uh, uh, done using our dual mode approach, which means folks were either, um, they, they completed via kind of a live telephone interview, the kind of traditional polling approach, or via email, um, through email or text message to, to fill it out online. So phone and online options available, English and Spanish available, um, to very de deliberately and, and thoughtfully make sure that we could reach people in a wide variety of ways that they were comfortable with and found convenience and um, that there weren't any barriers to participation around that. Um, as mentioned, we had uh, 520 uh, total interviews. That's inclusive of oversamples of residents of color who identify as Latino and also some residents of color who um, identify as something other than Latino, um, kind of making sure we get a good uh, mix of those uh, areas so that we uh, can kind of prize apart the differences because we know, of course, that uh, residents of color are not a monolith um, and their, their opinions and, and thoughts can really differ. Um, as mentioned, we're going to show you uh, the overall survey results throughout, and there are places where I'll call out uh, places where we saw statistically, uh, stati statistically significant differences. Um, but I also have available a big book of uh, cross -ups. So if we reach the end and you have some more questions, I can kind of dig into that. And also very willing to provide memos or, or, or do follow-up after this presentation as well. So let's start with uh, the results. Um, some key issues facing the city. Um, the first question we asked was kind of seen setting, asking people to tell us how satisfied are they with overall quality of life in, in the city of Milwaukee. And 89% said they're satisfied, and that, that is a very good figure. Um, I do a lot of my work throughout Oregon, throughout the West Coast. Um, there has been, um, perhaps unsurprisingly, a lot more pessimism lately. Lots of different issues are kind of uh, leading to some cynicism and some negativity, but to see a number this high is, is a good uh, indication that folks in your community at least recognize that close to home things are going rather well. 
Um, we did think it was notable and interesting that Latino residents were more likely to re report being very satisfied. It's 31% for residents overall and 43% for Latino residents. Um, so both of those figures, I think, are, are, are some starting out on a positive note. We did also ask, you know, what is the single most important issue for the city to address over the next year? This is, you know, important as you're thinking about budgeting and um, those sorts of things. Um, at the very top of the list uh, was mentioned houselessness. Um, lots of people refer to it as homelessness as well. Crime and safety was a key concern. Roads and infrastructure repair, you know, a variety of kind of uh, physical items that they, they know the city um, has some role in taking care of. And then a variety of other concerns, affordable housing, cost of living, um, sidewalks more specifically, uh, some, you know, smattering having to do with traffic, parking, things like that. But overall, I think if you kind of, uh, you know, put together houselessness and affordable housing, um, that would really match um, what we're seeing throughout your region and throughout the state and throughout the West Coast and even across the country, um, that housing is just a, a key critical issue and the ways it, it kind of manifests as houselessness in one way is, is something that's especially standing out more and more. Um, here are some uh, kind of direct quotes from folks. Um, this is just a selection because, of course, we had hundreds to choose from here, uh, but just wanted to give you a, a flavor of how people are talking about these kinds of issues. So next, one key question that was asked in the January 2020 survey that we repeated here in spring of 2022 had to do with the cost of housing. So in 2020, um, those surveyed 75% said the cost of housing in the city is too high. Uh, at this time, they said 56%. I took a good look at the crosstabs though, because of course that kind of uh, result can kind of hide beneath it. Lots of interesting distinctions by uh, critical differences here. And so we saw that the uh, set of people of color who are not Latino uh, were especially likely to see housing prices as too high, 64% said that was the case for them. Renters and especially lower income households, 79% of those folks said housing prices are too high, the, co the cost of housing, so that could include rent as well. Um, so I think that's a significant finding there. Now turning to abuse of city services, we've had a couple different ways of, of kind of evaluating how people feel about these uh, services provided by the city. Um, we asked them whether they approve or disapprove of just the overall quality of services, how the city seeks input, and how the city spends tax dollars. And you've got positive marks on all of these metrics, um, particularly the quality of services overall. 79% approved there, just 15% disapproving. 69% approving of uh, how you engage and, and seek input. Uh, majority is there saying they approve of how the city spends tax dollars it receives. I would say this is a very common pattern that we see um, where that's one where people have a little more innate skepticism about government and, and may not be um, you know, evaluating you based on, on particular knowledge, but maybe some ideological things at play. So to see that a little lower down on the list isn't surprising. 58% approval rating is really excellent. Um, so I would say that's uh, you know all good news on this. <coughs> So then turning to city services in Morris Hill, um, we asked residents two questions about 13 different key city services. The first was, how important is that service to making Milwaukee a good place to live? 13 different uh, services there. And then, same set of services, are you satisfied or dissatisfied? Um, because not every resident uses every service. Um, some, some folks just, you know, because they don't have kids or because they're a senior or, you know, any number of reasons their lived experience may differ. Uh, we did produce an informed satisfaction score which shows uh, the, the satisfaction among those with uh, an opinion either way. Um, so we'll show you how those two kind of things interact. We'll, we have a grid where we can show you the things that people value the most, how satisfied. Things that they value least, how satisfied. And that can really be helpful in budgeting and, and thinking about places where you have uh, places to celebrate and places where you have room for growth. So on the first uh, set, that's about importance. So here we're seeing what do people in your city value. At the top of the list here, and you can see this is ranked by the share who gave it one of the top two scores, extremely or very important. Um, and it's 80% or higher pretty much on all of these. Maintaining streets, providing utilities, public safety and policing, attract and, and, and retention of local businesses, and sharing information uh, with the community about ongoing city business. 
So some really fundamental um, kind of city uh, mandates are, are here um, seen as highly valuable. Majority is also seen as highly valuable, uh, creating safe places for people to walk and bike, managing development, libraries, city codes, parking, and community events. Uh, majorities really uh, highly value those things. And you can see if you add up extremely and very important and somewhat important as well, um, you, you have you know, very broad majorities valuing these things. So you know, just to give us a sense of the, the ranking there, we um, kind of look at those high-end responses there. Turning to the satisfaction question, we see that residents are most satisfied with libraries, utilities, and police services. Those are ones that are 80% or higher satisfaction rates, ratings there. Um, creating safe places for people to walk and bike, public safety, uh, community events, and information. Uh, those are ones where seven and 10 or more are satisfied as well. And you can see those numbers that are dissatisfied are you know, one quarter or even lower. Um, a little bit higher if we kind of squint for places to look at dissatisfaction for uh, safe places for walking, biking, and public safety. Um, Turning down the list a bit more, um, places where there is a little more room for improvement, managing streets, man maintaining streets specifically. 59% uh, satisfied with that, just 18% very satisfied with that, and 40% uh, dissatisfied. So closer to kind of half and half there. Um, still majority satisfied, but that's a place where if you're looking for places to where there's room for improvement, I think it's clear throughout the survey that there's some interest and in, um, uh, some attention to, to streets. So that informed satisfaction metric. Again, we kind of remove those don't knows and look at just the folks who have some kind of working knowledge enough to give a rating. And the ranking is very similar. Um, libraries are at the top. Utilities are, are, are high as well. Police services, community events, uh, things like that, all very high satisfaction ratings. And then moving down a little bit more, I've got informed satisfaction. We've got a 60-40 split there. Um, but that is the place where we see the most dissatisfaction, even among those who uh, know enough to say. Can I ask, did you um, mix up the order of those in questions, or were they always asked in the same order? Yeah, so each item was asked in a random order. Okay. Uh, we didn't want to kind of, you know, bias in any particular direction, um, uh -huh. hearing things that people may value more or less, and, and we also don't know the answer until we ask. Uh -huh. um, everyone was asked importance first and satisfaction second, but the items within it were randomized. Okay, thank you. Um, so here you can see kind of looking at the, the kind of intersection between the two questions. Uh, this corner up here is a place where you can kind of pat yourself on the back. It's things that people really value and they also are quite satisfied with. Uh, so providing utilities, public safety and policing are up there. Um, places where you see lower satisfaction um, and also higher importance that is attracting and retaining local businesses and we're maintaining streets. Um, and then there's a number of things over here that are relatively less important, but satisfaction levels are high. Uh, so we did have a, a few particular questions about downtown. Wanted to look at you know how people get there, how they spend their time when they're there, what what they kind of feel about the future of downtown. So we have a few slides in that series. Um, here we ask people how important is it to have these different types of shops and services downtown. Um, dining options was the most popular, 79% saying that's extremely or very important, and over 90% saying that's at least somewhat important to them. Retail shops also highly valued. Two-thirds valuing parking um, as extremely or very important, and then events a bit lower down on the list. Um, and I think that might have a little bit to do with the um, kind of ongoing, uh, you know, not chaos, but uncertainty <laughs> around uh, gathering and how, how that kind of moves forward. Um, that's something we've been seeing in a lot of different results. So people are kind of interested in getting out there and supporting local businesses and things like that. Um, and you can see that here as well. Um, so here we have uh, some questions about how people get to downtown, um, how they get to and from it. Now, the most obvious one and the most broad one is the car. 90% of folks get around that way, and that's something we see uh, kind of across the country, everywhere except, you know, New York City or something like that. Um, that is the most common way of getting around, but a very significant minority, 36%, uh, walk to get downtown. Busing, bicycling, taking the max, also uh, fairly common, about one in 10 say they do that. And of course, people, you know, they use multiple options, so we allow multiple options. And here's a place where we did see some interesting demographic differences. 
Um, biking was much more common for residents of color, both Latino and, and otherwise. Uh, walking was more common for renters and those under age 50. And transit was much more common for low-income households. So you can see that the kind of variety of ways people get around can really differ by their lived experience and, and their demographics. Um, we have a question specific to parking. 70% um, say downtown, it's fairly easy for them to find uh, residential parking on neighborhood streets. On-street parking also, two-thirds about saying that's at least somewhat easy to find. Um, and a little more challenges, but still majority is saying that off-street parking on parking lots is, is a little harder to find downtown. Um, so turning to a few final uh, kind of uh, substantive questions, we asked a little bit more about streets and property maintenance. Um, we asked people just generally, do they think city codes are too strict about right or not strict enough? And here you can see for most people, they say they're about right or they don't really know either way. Um, and then those with an opinion about strict or not strict enough um, are kind of split 14 to, to 10%. So overall, folks are satisfied. Um, the difference uh, from, from the two years ago or so, I think that might be a little to do with uh, some of the differences there in the sampling. Essentially, but those folks were much less aware um, and a little uh, more likely to say too strict, but this is really kind of a margin of error difference in a, in a survey this size. Um, on utility costs, we asked people in general, do they think it's too high, the right amount, or too low? Um, they're kind of split between too high and the right amount, um, and residents of color, particularly Latinos, were especially likely to see utility costs as too high. Um, same with low-income households, 71% of them see uh, utility costs as too high versus 45% among residents overall. Um, so that's kind of a significant finding there that, that people are kind of split on that um, with some, some differences there with demographics. Miranda, can I ask you? We provided a little information and context, um, letting them know the average utility bill for single hey, Miranda. household. Uh, yes. Sorry, the mayor wanted to jump in with a question. Sure. Can you go back to that slide, the last one? Um, you, you said that f folks who are low income f felt like our uh, utility costs were too high. Was there any question in there that ascertained whether or not they were taking advantage of the low income utility uh, prices? I know we did not ask a question about that. That might be a good thing to do in the future, either as a kind of, uh, you know, understanding whether people know about it, um, and also maybe directing folks to, to that resource if they tell us that they might essentially qualify. But no, that was not a part of the survey. Okay, thanks. Yep. Um, so as mentioned, we, we provided some context. We told them the average bill for a single, sing, single family household. Um, and all the things that provides for them um, and ask the question again. A split majority then says the amount is about right, 52%, so that, that figure goes up by about five points. Um, so we see people, given that context, change their uh, opinion just a bit. Um, for low income residents and for residents of color, um, who were some of the ones who were a little more sensitive to cost initially, there was a greater change um, by 10 points. They were more likely to say the cost is about right. And I would imagine if they knew that there was um, some assistance by, by income, um, that would also kind of change that picture as well. But we didn't ask it, so I couldn't say for sure. Um, we asked a question about willingness to pay for increased maintenance of side streets. Now we didn't ask about you know exactly how much or, or how it might be collected or things like that, like we may do in you know a ballot measure survey that my company does all the time. Just a general kind of willingness to um, to, to to invest in this. And 53% say they are willing. Um, that has leapt up quite a bit from 41% in January 2020. And that strongly willing number, um, which was at 7% before, is now 22%. Um, so that kind of, I think that really kind of matches what we were seeing in other places in the survey where people are uh, starting to notice street maintenance and, and call that to mind among you know all the other kinds of things the city does as a place where there might be room for improvement and investment. We also had a, a set of questions about communication with city government and, and different ways to engage, participate in events, things like that. These are critical questions as we kind of enter a, a kind of hybrid uh, phase of, of, of kind of engagement and, and communication. Um, so we asked people how do they get most of their news about the city, and they were allowed to give us multiple responses, of course. Um, the city news letter, the Milwaukee Pilot, was fairly popular. 52% say they get a lot of city news that way. Um, but also just good old-fashioned neighbors, friends, and family. 35% uh, get information that way. 
social media, local TV news, things like that. Also important sources of information for folks so you can kind of see um, the variety of things there. And this is another one where, of course, demographics have a lot to, to, to go into play here. Social media is a more common source for younger residents and residents of color. Um, I thought it was interesting that the lowest and the highest income brackets are a little more plugged into the Milwaukee pilot. Um, and middle income households uh, were a little more plugged into social media. So kind of a, a mix of uh, impressions there, and, and those are the ones that really stood out. We also asked people, here's you know, a list of ways to participate in city government or share your opinion with uh, decision makers and, and let us know which ones you've done. Um, low numbers, um, overall lots of folks are saying they, they haven't done these and I would say that you're not unique in that way. Folks have a lot of demands, a lot of busy lives. Um, and you can see a little bit about that in future slides. But essentially um, attending a meeting on a specific issue or directly contacting an elected official or attending you know, a city council meeting um, or a city website, those were the most common uh, responses, but none were particularly common. Um, and I think notably here, Engage Milwaukee, which is relatively new, um, there was a subset there, about 10%, who uh, weren't even kind of familiar exactly with what that is. Um, another kind of thing we asked about was uh, visitation, and this includes physical places, but also um, websites and social media. Um, we added anyone who does it even, even not too frequently uh, into this column here. Um, most common is visiting the Letting Library. 40% say they've ever done that. 14% uh, say they do it very frequently. The city's website, the city's social media, also relatively frequent. Um, and then visiting city buildings other than the library or doing some of these community events, um, a little less common, um, a little less frequent as well, which I think might make sense because they're not held you know, as often as a library that's just there and open all the time. Uh, we did look at some differences here. We have seen increases in people using the website. I think that makes a lot of sense, uh, given that uh, we have had to move a lot of our lives online in the last two years. Uh, also, library visitorship has gone up as well. Um, and then community events has gone down. And I think that also makes sense for the same reason the website visits have, have gone up. Uh, we did ask people whether they would prefer to interact with the city online or in person. Uh, most said it doesn't matter, 44%. Uh, they could do it either way, or they just you know, don't do it enough to, to really think about it too much. 38% though say they like, they like doing things online. Um, and the people who mo are a little more likely to prefer those online interactions are younger residents and homeowners. Um, still though, still a plurality of those uh, say it doesn't matter either way. So I think there's some indication here that, that kind of moving things online um, broadly is very helpful uh, to folks having that as an option, um, although there's still a, a percentage of folks, 17% here, so who prefer the in-person when they can have it. Um, so we did ask people to tell us in their own words what kind of is, what would make it more helpful, what would make it easier for you to participate in the events. We saw some of the numbers for participation were in the 30s or lower, so tell us more about why. Um, you know, 15%, these, these responses are all over the board. Uh, lots of folks said, I don't know, or just, you know, refused to answer the question. It was toward the end of the survey. 21% uh, said that. 15% said nothing. I'm not more likely to do it no matter what you do. Um, but a wide variety of other responses among those who did offer um, their thoughts on this. Some people just said, I don't have enough time. Busy lives. Um, they just can't, can't quite find the time for it in their schedule. Um, others said, they want more reminders, more scheduling options at different times of day, and we've got a little more um, uh, data within that of you know people who said I want weekends, I want weekdays, things like that. It's a little all of the four there, um, but also things like showing that they matter, if the topics are interesting, um, if they felt like there was less drama, um, so a variety there of kind of social uh, barriers and also just kind of uh, technical or, or scheduling barriers for folks. And here you can see some responses in their own words. And one person in particular likes uh, Zoom. It makes it easier with uh, child care responsibilities. 
Um, so this will take me to conclusions. Um, and then after that, I'm happy to take questions. Um, just in general, um, I would say residents are very satisfied with quality of life here in Milwaukee, and they really approve of the city's work providing city services, spending tax dollars, seeking public input. Uh, we do a ton of work for public agency clients across the country, and I would say these numbers look really great compared to, to some of your neighbors, um, and even, even uh, folks in other parts of the region and the, and the West Coast. Um, but there are, of course, some problems, um, and folks shared what, what's concerning them right now. Road repairs, homelessness, houselessness, crime, housing costs, those are key concerns. Um, housing costs in particular um, are, are driving some concern there. That's something we see across the country, and particularly on the West Coast. Um, when it comes to services, some of the things people value the most are also the ones they're most satisfied with. Um, you know, police services and public safety, utilities, things like that. But there are also uh, places where we see clear room for improvement, and that really has to do with street maintenance um, and a little bit attracting and retaining businesses. Uh, most state property maintenance codes are about right, um, and they're willing to pay more for that. And then utility costs, they're kind of split on that. Given a little more information, uh, majorities are uh, saying that they're, they're about right. Um, so I know we don't have a ton of time, but I'm happy to take questions or talk about some other information we can provide um, at a later date. Anybody? Any questions? I guess I would just be curious if there's any breakout information on demographics regarding the the um, what would get you more interested in engaging with the city question, other than nothing. <laughs> Yeah, so we, uh, let's see, I might have that handy. And if you don't, that's okay. That's yeah, that might be one we have to do a special report on because it was an open-ended question. Yeah, yeah. Um, the coding in that is a little more labor intensive, but we can look into that. Are you, you're kind of interested in seeing what pops out or are you looking at um, age, income, race and ethnicity, things like that? All of the above, yeah, yeah. I'm just, I'm just curious if there's more nuance to that than than what we I'm had sure in the slide. We can take yeah. a, a close look at that. Thanks. Yep. Yeah, I mean, there are a ton of things in there that I'd love to know more about, but um, we we have other things on our agenda tonight. Uh, will we get a report? Yes, I can share the report on the cross tabs. Yeah. So okay. now that they're done, yeah. um, so happy to share. Okay. Yep. Thank you. That'd be great. Well, good, good job. It's, it seemed very, very thorough, and it's uh, good to know that we score pretty well relative to other cities. We know that street maintenance is always going to be a thing. Potholes. It's always the potholes. Mm -hmm. In every um, city. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Yep. Look forward to getting to dig into it a little bit. All right. Anybody else? Else? All right. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks for having me. And we see this data as a resource for you. So please um, ask us any questions you've got, and we're happy to dig in. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Have Thank a good you. night. All right. Our next item is the City Hall Surplus Process, a resolution. The public hearing on the proposed city property per, uh, surplus action is called to order. The purpose of the hearing is to hear the staff report, take public comment on the proposed action, and declare the current city hall building to be surplus property. Does any council member wish to announce actual or potential conflicts of interest? No. no. Nor do I, and I see none. Um, So our community development director will present. All right. Thank you. Good evening again, Mayor and Council. Joseph Brilio, community development director. And we will now be starting the official process of repurposing City Hall. So join me in beginning the surplus hearing. Some basic highlights I and mean, I know you are all there for these but in case someone's out there looking and why are we here tonight 
Back in March 2020, the city did close on the Advantage Credit Union building just up the street with the desire to consolidate and make that the new city hall. That same month, the city hall blue ribbon committee, uh, blue ribbon, yeah, city hall blue ribbon committee was uh, starting its work and it was commissioned by the city council. And they met for over a year to help engage in community and do some outreach and figure out what type of um, use, or at least what type of goals behind the use that would come to city hall. Fast forward that to last October, council adopted formally adopted project development goals, which were based on the, that outreach from the City Hall Blue Ribbon Committee. And if I remember correctly, I don't think he, this council changed any of the, the project goals from the Blue, yeah, the Blue Ribbon Committee, which is great. Um, and then beginning in 2022, we received a little bit of a curveball with the reversionary rights um, deed open space requirements for the park space and the open space that's currently here with the school district. And so we began the replat process and I'll go into that a little bit more in a second. And then also in this whole context of, of what we're talking about tonight, sometime in 2023, I'm not gonna put Kelly Brooks to any, any hard date, but sometime <laughs> in 2023, we will all be consolidating and moving. And so there's this uh, hope and desire to align as much as we can and make sure that this building doesn't doesn't stand vacant for that long. Um, just some refreshers for what you all adopted as the project goals. Creates destination, historic preservation, minority women business enterprise contracting, sustainable practices, maintains the open space. These will all be embedded in the RFP and be used to weigh each bid that comes to us, as well as any public benefit in addition to um, these goals. And we are uh, also exploring additional preservation measures besides just those found in the city code, uh, chapter 19403, the historic preservation overlay. Um, so there could be a, even more uh, teeth involved with the historic preservation side of things. That's what we're at least pursuing at this point. So the replat process, it's currently, well, I'll start here. Before the replat process, as you can see on the left, this block that we currently sit on was eight deeded lots. <laughs> City Hall was actually built on top of property, lot, or property lines, as you can see. Um, and so we cleaned that up. And so at, on the right, you see what happens after the replant. So it basically goes from eight lots to two parcels. The proposed parcel one is what we're talking about tonight. The proposed parcel two, it cleans everything up so that um, that space that had the reversionary rights remains intact in perpetuity. And so that will be unchanging until the city, I don't know, I don't think it will change ever, but I will never say never. Um, with this and also reducing par parcel one, it, race, it basically reduces the potential to develop that little parcel. It really squeezes things in. So not much can happen um, on that lot. It's essentially a building. That's really what you get. So tonight what we're talking about really is this red, uh, yellow square on the screen. It's 10,264 square feet of space and includes city hall and just the frontage outside. All the other property around that square will remain in the city um, maintenance in our purview or overview or our powers that be. And so the trees will remain. Uh, the parking lot will still be ours until we unless we want to do something else with it. The sculpture garden remains and we can continue to curate art as long as we want. So that's a public benefit. And then the park space will continue for as long um, as we see fit as well. And so the RFP will not address that parking lot at all? Or will it say like there could be a potential to rent the parking lot from the city? That yes, kind of thing. exactly. Okay. So the required steps that we're taking tonight, we're having the public hearing. The two other steps that also occurred is the newspaper notice, the mailing notice that went out um, five days prior at least, 
Those are also in the packet. And then the action requested is to approve the resolution that would designate City Hall as surplus property, authorizing city manager to proceed with the sale and transfer, set the minimum criteria for the sale of property at, with the adopted project development goals, as well as the appraised market value of the property to come. And assuming that you are all okay with that, next steps would include working with a broker for solicitation negotiation assistance, developing and releasing the RFP, I hope it's in the next 30 to 60 days. And then the RFP selection committee will come together, which also includes uh, some uh, uh, Blue Ribbon Committee members. Uh, review the proposals, then take those top, or the top, or the several top or proposals to executive session for confirmation by the council, and then hopefully move into exclusive negotiations sometime in fall, winter. It's gonna be fast. It's gonna feel fast, at least. Um, Essentially, that is the presentation. If there's any questions, happy to answer them. I just want to point out, Tom Brady didn't say never. <laughs> you must know how much I dislike Tom Brady. <laughs> As a Miami Dolphins fan. Oh. It's true, though. Thank you, Counselor. <laughs> so I guess my concern through this whole process has been um, we'll, we'll, the rubber will meet the road I guess when we get back you know bids under the RFP but I really want to be careful that we don't um, overweight uh, certain criteria that might make something that was be really cool, but maybe doesn't have as solid a funding or, you know, whatever, um, you know, not selected. I think, um, you know, often, you know, we're looking for whoever's got the deepest pockets when we're doing these property dispositions, and I don't think that should be what we're looking for here, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah, so I just, I, that's my concern, is that we, we go into it with, you know, totally open to people who meet those criteria and that not necessarily, you know, meet, satisfy certain ones and that not one is more important than another, I guess, you know, to preserve the flexibility for the ranking process. I hear you saying like opportunity, folks just need. An opportunity, that's right, yeah. that's right. <laughs> That's right. Yep, and I, I will second that very much. I think, you know, we, particularly when we're doing this, we've had the practice in the past of choosing the applicant with the deepest pockets. And, and it may not, I mean, that may be the right choice here, but it may not. Right. And I just want us to have that flexibility. I, I think this is going to be a very unique little journey for us all because it's it's this is an amazing this building has served the city for almost 100 years um it's there are, uh, there's lots of interest I'll, sh I'll share that much they're all very different and they all all different sides of of the table as far as what they would offer so how they package that is yet to be seen but i do hear your your concern that um we can build up the i would say the public benefit component to weigh as heavy as a financial um, wherewithal, and we can we can make that more of part of the weighing, if you'd like. That's certainly a part. I guess I I don't I don't understand uh, entirely because I'm uh, like what am I trying to say here? Yes, opportunity. I also have some anxiety around choosing someone who five years down the road can't pay for maintaining a historic structure in downtown Milwaukee and it's it's on our main street. So I do think there is some balance that we need to consider there. Um, and this is all hypotheticals. I don't know what RFQ is going to bring in. I don't know who the interested parties are. So well, and the RFP could call for sale or, or lease, lease, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. true. Right. Yep. Um, exactly. There's no guarantee that anybody, no matter how deep their pockets are, could maintain. 
I mean. Sure, but you can ask questions in the process that highlight that yeah. ongoing maintenance of the property is is of value to the community. You know, I, I agree, but there are ways you can explore what that means to whoever expresses interest. Yeah, I mean, certainly it's like I said, it's going to be it's going to be different than other properties. I, you don't want to consider exactly that as the the longevity of whoever we choose to. I imagine if something we did choose or the council did choose or select didn't um, pan out in two years, that would be that'd be a, a failure. I don't think any of us want to be in that space. So um, they're all things that need to be considered for sure yeah, in this process. If we were just considering lease, we wouldn't have to do this hearing. But yeah, just because oh, interesting. <laughs> just okay. we're also considering the sale is we need to have a hearing. Yeah. And has the uh, committee been established for the selection? No, uh, just we have two confirmed from the Blue Ribbon Committee that have to be on it or that we're appointed. And then it hasn't been figured out yet beyond that. Okay. And did I remember from your staff report that it'll be open for 60 days? You're trying to get it out within trying, 60 days true, and yes. then it'll be open for 60 or? Typically 30 days is how long we'd like it to, that's kind of the common practice. Okay. Um, I, I mean, we did talk before with Layla, I guess, about trying to leave it open longer just for the non-traditional you know, the opportunity people. I mean, maybe the word is out there enough. I don't know. Um, I do have a list of, uh, of people that have either approached me or approached council members. Yeah. I do have a reoccurring list. So that it'll go out to those that the broker helps us, um, you know, they're those channels, those huh. professional channels, as well as a lot of the, the people that we've had relationships with um, that have been interested in the building since, uh, for the last several months at least. Yeah, there's... There's quite a lot of interest, so mm -hmm. I don't know that we necessarily need 60 days unless you yeah. can yeah. think of. Could easily make it longer if you guys would like it. 60 days until, 30 to 60 days to release the RFP is the goal, and then 30 days just to have it open and closed would be the standard, but if you think it needs to be 45. I mean, I guess what I don't know is like the people on the, Blue Ribbon Committee that had particular interests. Some of them were like uh, an art center, mm -hmm. community art center, and they, you know, made the point that you need to get out to the county and the state and all the arts community. You know, though assembling the money for those groups may be a slower thing. Um, so I guess that that that's the one example that kind of sticks in my head. Um, I would hope that they've been working on that. Well, that's the question, I guess. Did we count on the Blue Ribbon Committee members to do that? Or have we been doing any outreach on that? You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Any other questions? No? Have we received any uh, emails or letter, anything, any correspondence at all? No, Mayor. I have not either. All right. Does anyone wish to comment on the proposed property surplus action? I'll go ahead and read through this in case there's somebody on Zoom trying to get their hand up or something. Council will now take public testimony on the proposed action. I will recognize speakers and any questions should be addressed through me. Before you speak, please state your name and city of residence for the record. For those who wish to testify in person, please submit a yellow comment card to staff. If you are on Zoom and would like to speak, please raise your hand, write a note in the Zoom chat or email ocr at milwaukeeoregon.gov. For those who wish to testify and are calling in through Zoom, please raise your hand by dialing star nine. Presentation times for all speakers will be limited. To indiv will be limited. Individuals will have three minutes and representatives of groups will have 10 minutes. Please confine your remarks to the proposed action, avoid repetition and irrelevant information. 
Anything? Anybody? Seeing none. Any more questions for staff? I'll move to close the public comment part of the City Hall property surplus hearing. I'll second. It has been moved and seconded to close the public comment part of the City Hall property surplus hearing. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None heard. Uh, the public comment part of the public com Public, let me start over. The public comment part no, it's of the city. Uh, it is written twice. It is repeated, like, yeah. I'm getting tired or something. <laughs> the public comment part of the city hall property surplus action is closed. Is there any council discussion? Kind of already did. I would just note that we're lucky to be where we are. I think, you know, I mean, we had this opportunity sort of presented to us with the build, with the purchase of the new building and with very good interest rates where they were. And I think we're mm -hmm. very fortunate to be in this, in this moment. So I'm just excited for what we see come forward. And I think that we're, the cards fell pretty yeah. darn well in our favor, so. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. thank you to staff for yeah. figuring out how to make this work. This is this is a really nicely done package. Yeah, a lot of cities have, have really had to do hard things to get the city hall that they needed. Um, when we knew, we've known for 20 years, more than 20 years, that we needed a new city hall. And so this, working out this smoothly, the level of interest we have in this building, we're not gonna end up with a boarded up city hall like some cities have. <laughs> And the purchase price, I mean, we wouldn't have been able to build a new city hall for anything close. Not no. even close. No. Yeah, it would have been easily double what we paid for that yeah. building. So it's all working out really well. Don't jinx it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I grew up Catholic. I'm very superstitious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's treatment for that. <laughs> All right, is council ready to vote? I would entertain a motion. I move to approve the resolution declaring part of the city owned property located at 10722 Southeast Main Street to be surplus and authorizing the city manager to sell or lease the property. I'll second. It has been moved and seconded to approve the resolution declaring part of the city owned property located at 10722 Southeast Main Street to be surplus and authorizing the city manager to sell or lease the property. Is there any further discussion? I'll just have to say it's a little weird to surplus the place you're sitting <laughs> having a hearing. It feels like, you know, it's gonna be swept out from under us <laughs> as we speak. In any case, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None heard. It passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor, could we take we a very a break? short break? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. What do we need? Five, ten? Yes, yeah. Fine with me. Five minutes? Yes. Yeah. All right. Let's make it uh, eight fifteen. We will be back.
like giant size too. Like it's a big travel mug. <laughs> All righty, and we're back. Comprehensive plan implementation, housing and parking code amendments continued and ordinance. The public hearing on the proposed housing and parking code amendments, file number ZA-2021-002 is called to order. The purpose of this hearing is to hear the final staff report, final one, the very last and final staff report. Finish council deliberation and consider adopting the proposed code changes. Does any council member wish to announce actual or potential conflicts of interest? Nor do I, and I see none. Um, so, Vera. Hello, council <laughs> and mayor, thank you very much. Um, here to present the very brief staff report, which is um, we have um, gone through um, the code and made the changes that we discussed at the last um, hearing on the 15th. I'm happy to answer any questions um, if there's anything that we've missed um, or, I'm sorry, uh, or anything that we needed to tweak or add, um, but we were hoping for final deliberations and a vote this evening, if at all possible. But if there are any other questions or tweaks or anything, um, Let's, let's do it. Thank you. Did you, um, so I called about that one page. Yes. Did you, were you able to figure out a? Yeah. Um, the mayor called um, today to clarify the chart on page three, or table 301.4, so it's RS91. Um, it's the chart that talks about um, the minimum lot sizes for the various um, housing types in the RMD zone and um, rightfully pointed out that it may be confusing for folks um, because it might look like that a townhouse or a cottage could only be on a lot of 1,500 to 2,999 square feet as opposed to sort of any of them. It's intended to be minimum lot sizes. Um, so the clarification I would offer is to write minimum at the top of, um, top of the table and pull all of the housing types into all of the columns. We can always simplify it later, but I think at this point I'd rather err on redundancy and just make sure that everyone is reading all of the things in all of the columns um, as it's applicable. So the townhouse and the cottage, and we would just pull those forward. Um, it's possible that someone could put a cottage on a larger lot, um, however unlikely that might be, but um, rather than um, confuse things by oversimplifying the table, I'd rather rep repeat um, the well, I guess types. if someone was building townhomes or cottages for rent and not for sale, they might be building them on a bigger lot, right? Sure, well, townhomes are already on their own oh, lots, okay. but um, but a cottage yeah. cluster could be all on one lot. lot. This is right. specific to if they were dividing and putting the cottages individually on okay. their own lots. So that okay. That's right, there. exactly, cool. yeah. But we just didn't want to um, confuse folks about what, what was permitted, so it was a good clarification, thank you. So we can make that change. Were there any other catches that people had reading through? Uh, I was just talking with Vera at the back of the room because I have things that, that I think we determined pretty well fall into the Scrivener's errors uh, level. Um, you know, things, for example, I'll just do this one because I just triple checked my math. Looking at the clean version of the code on RS 232 to 245, somehow 19.505.2 doesn't seem to be there. Like we just went straight from one to <clears throat> dot one to dot three. So it's things like that. Um, and, and I've got like four of them. So I'll just email those. I'm happy to double check those. We may not have included that section in the code if we didn't make any changes to it. Ah, so okay. we have there jumped sections, but, but, I, gotcha. but I will double check it to make sure that yeah, we yeah. didn't just not include it <laughs> by accident. Sure, thanks. Um, yep. So is there... Go back to your question, Mayor. I'm sorry yes. because I just want to make sure. It, it, we were on page 90, RS 91. 91. Yep. The proposed um, edit to the chart would be that you would add minimum. So it's. But then underneath, if we put. 
that would that seems like if you then put that's kind of like a double negative you're right right so i don't think that works i think right. if you just add the houses that's, that's great that's what i was suggesting yep we'll okay. just take them in yeah, yeah. I, I wondered i had that same thought i was like yep does that work but okay. yeah yeah it's kind of like a double negative i had a super simple idea before that I ran by um, Laura and it was you know it was truly the minimum and it was just a couple of things in each column and we thought nope let's put everything everywhere but that negates the need for the minimum piece yep. so I will take that part out yep, yep. cool thank you good any other questions all right is there any council discussion beyond that Uh, well, whenever you're ready to go to a vote, I have a statement. I'm going to explain why I'm going to vote no. Yes. Okay. <laughs> well. But I don't know if you have other things you want to do before that. No, I'm. Is council ready to vote? I mean, I'll I'll say I think that this has been an amazing body of work and. Thank you to everyone who gave testimony. Thank you to so much to our planning commission. Thank you to our planning staff. This has been a heavy lift and a hard time. We wouldn't have done the public engagement the way we did it were it not for the fact that we needed to keep this moving. And I know that was a challenge for, for staff and planning commission, volunteers, everyone who was involved. Um, so thank you to everyone for showing up anyway. Um, yeah. And it's an experiment, you know? I think we've done some really excellent work and I think we made some mistakes and we don't know what those are yet. So we'll put it out in the world. Good. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna explain why I'm voting no on today's code. There's a lot to like here. I'm a fan of middle housing. I lived in townhomes for most of my 20s and 30s. Um, uh, I particularly think we need townhomes and cottage clusters to give new, less expensive options for first time home buyers, as well as those who are ready to downsize. But let's not kid ourselves that they're gonna be affordable. We're talking $400,000 homes instead of $600,000 homes. I do think HB 2001 went too far. It could have created more opportunity without creating the incentive for so many scrape offs. I am convinced that five years from now we will have less affordable housing than we do today because we will lose quite a bit of our naturally occurring affordable housing. Thankfully, we have a baseline of how many demolitions Milwaukee has seen in recent years, which is about three to four on average. And if I were a, a betting person, I would not surpri be surprised if in a decade we don't see HB 2001 rolled back on the state level to some degree or modified. I think today's vote is a vote that will be devastating to some Milwaukee neighborhoods. Others, particularly neighborhoods further east and further from transit lines and neighborhoods without many large lots will have less impact. But both the size and scale of what will be built on some of the 10 to 14,000 foot, 10 to 14,000 square foot lots in Ardenwald, for example, and the elimination of off-street parking requirements will create strife among neighbors, and we already heard a complaint tonight about the mailbox issue, headaches for city staff, and possibly even the police five years from now. The one saving grace that we have over Portland, Eugene, and some other locations is that we maximize lot coverage around 50%, while some cities allow building right up to the setbacks. So that preserves some amount of buffer between homes, space for trees, and outdoor enjoyment by residents. I do think reducing or eliminating off-street parking requirements will make sense in five to 10 years, but I think we are being premature in doing that at this juncture. Once the 15, 1,500 or so apartments in the pipeline get built and the first wave of new infill under this ordinance gets built, which is gonna include a big development on Johnson Creek Boulevard, we may see ridership that will lead to increased bus services. I hope the city will also pursue shuttle services to get more people to light rail as, been, as has been discussed for many years. And yes, shared cars and autonomous vehicles will at some point reduce the reliance of house Households on privately owned cars, but that is still some years away. 
So I think the path the Planning Commission went down based on Commissioner Edge's fuzzy math was a mistake, but I won't repeat all the problems with that calculation that I outlined a few meetings back. I do take some comfort in knowing that a couple of the councilors live in an area that is likely to be one of the most impacted. Uh, another concern I have is that we haven't updated our historic preservation code. Uh, our, the, there has been no uh, protection for any mid-century buildings in Milwaukee. The last time the preservation code was updated was in the 90, or in the 80s, I believe, maybe early 90s, uh, when those mid-century homes weren't yet old enough to be considered historic for historic preservation. So I am also concerned about what we will see in that regard in the years ahead. It pains me to say it, but I also think we didn't do enough public outreach on this package. I know we have been limited in terms of ability to interface with the public during the pandemic, but I think we could have done better. Several members of the Comp Plan Implementation Committee, members who came from different perspectives, have commented in their comments to both the Planning Commission and to us on finding the CPIC process less than satisfactory, and I would agree that it left something to be desired. Moreover, while there was some good outreach by the NDAs in spring 2021 and a single survey in early 2021 over Engage Milwaukee, we really didn't make much use of that platform. And when the Planning Commission started adopting policy changes, such as the parking reduction, those were not called out for the public on Engage Milwaukee or in the pilot or in a second round of participation in NDA virtual meetings. On that point, as we launch into the further phases of comp plan work, and this sort of dovetails with some of the things Laura was saying to us earlier, including the tra transportation system plan and neighborhood hubs work, I hope we will be able to get back to public in-person meetings. We don't know what's ahead in terms of new COVID outbreaks and to what extent indoor meetings will be problematic come next fall, winter, but we're coming into the season where we can meet outdoors. So I hope we take advantage of that and hold outdoor open houses houses and even possibly outdoor presentations, maybe using the bleachers at North Clackamas Park or Milwaukee High School. The last two years have brought us kicking and screaming into a whole new world in so many ways. As, and as a city, we, we have adapted really well, but we can always do better. And today's housing code package is one where I think we fall short, so I will be voting no. As a counterpoint, before we take this vote, this has been a very long process. It started with a visioning that the city took, and out of that visioning, a very robust and thoughtful, comprehensive plan process that really lived into the future that we hope to make of the city. Many of the issues that we're facing are not of our making. Uh, it is in no way the city's fault that the cost of housing has outpaced wages. It is in no way the city's fault that climate change is occurring. But those are the realities that we have to deal with on the ground. I believe that with this work, we will be setting the standard for many cities in this state. I think we are one of the first cities to, particularly cities of our size, to adopt this work. And I think a lot of cities will look to us for leadership, for guidance. Um, I do believe that One of the mistakes made by our society over the last hundred years was creating a society for automobiles. Rather than cities designed for humans to exist, to be happy, to be comfortable, to be safe, we designed cities for automobiles. And this is one very early little step away from that type of a society. 
I think with our TSP, we can take some further steps away from that type of society and, and create a city that is truly livable, unlike most American cities. I'm very proud of the work that the Planning Commission did. I'm very proud of the work that the staff did. And I think this is a natural and appropriate extension of the work we did. We started with the visioning. So I am very proud and excited to be able to vote yes on this. And I, not to counter what you just, but I wanted to put a, put a little bit of a footnote on the not city's fault because the city did adopt land use. Racist zoning. Yeah. And racist zoning that was adopted throughout the country and that absolutely has contributed to climate change and the exclusionary patterns that we see both here in Milwaukee and across other cities that have adopt, that adopted similar code. The emphasis on cars is an emphasis on specific types of housing only being allowed and permitted throughout most of our city. So That's just true. to put a little bit that of a footnote on that, Absolutely. That, we, that our city definitely contributed. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> Any other comments before we vote? Then I would entertain a motion. I move for the first and second readings by title only and adoption of the ordinance amending the Milwaukee Comprehensive Plan Land Use Map and Residential Land Use Designation Municipal Code MMC Title 19 Zo Zoning Ordinance Title 17 Land Division, Title 12, Streets, Sidewalks, and Public Places, Title 13, Public Services, and amending the zoning map for the purpose of addressing middle housing and residential parking. File number ZA2021-002. I'll second. It has been moved for first and second readings by title only and adoption of the ordinance amending the Milwaukee Comprehensive Plan land use map and residential land use designations. Municipal Code MMC Title 19 Zoning Ordinance, Title 17 Land Division, Title 12 Streets, Sidewalks, and Public Places, Title 13 Public Services, and amending the zoning map for the purposes of addressing middle housing and residential parking, file number ZA 2021-002. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. The motion passes four to one. Um, Ms. Brooks, would you, let me see. I'm used to unanimous, so let me double check my uh, thing here. It doesn't poll us. So not, is, since the vote was not unanimous, the ordinance must be read at two separate meetings by um, whoever is presiding in that seat. This week it will be Ms. Brooks, next time it will be Ms. Ober probably. Please read the ordinance one time in full. Uh, an ordinance of the city of Milwaukee, Oregon, amending the Milwaukee Comprehensive Plan land use map and residential land use designations, municipal code MMC, title 19 zoning ordinance, title 17 land division, title 12 streets, sidewalks and public places, title 13 public services and amending the zoning map for the purpose of addressing middle housing and residential parking. File number ZA-2021-002. The second reading and adoption will be set for the next council meeting on May 3rd, 2022. Woohoo! I feel like we should be like streamers. Or <laughs> champagne, something. It's on May 3rd there. I think the, are you still supposed to poll? No. That, that'll no. occur after the second Oh, that occurs after the second meeting. Oh, yeah. got it, got it. Uh, 
I, I feel like I do have to channel Anne here just really quickly and recognize not um, recognize everyone. So council for the nights and nights and nights um, and months and months of work that have gone into all the different stages that have developed um, what you just voted on and also the staff, um, Vera um, has been working on this forever. Uh, Laura took over and uh, uh, from Denny and helped shepherd us to this point. Joseph stepped in and helped shepherd us as community development director. Um, Justin has been involved um, throughout and at every level um, and, uh, and Scott um, is always here helping make sure that all the meetings uh, work and go according to plan. So um, just wanted to give the shout out um, from this seat tonight, just recognizing all the hours of effort that you've put in and congratulate you. Thanks. Well done, everyone. All right. Comprehensive plan implementation, tree code continued, an ordinance. The continued public hearing on the proposed tree code amendments, file number ZA-2021-002 is called to order. The purpose of this hearing is to hear the final staff report, finish council deliberation, and consider adopting the proposed code changes. Does any council member wish to announce an actual or potential conflict of interest? Seeing none, nor do I. Uh, so, our climate and natural resources manager, Natalie, take it away. Good evening again. Um, I don't have much for you uh, tonight. I am just um, here to present the final staff report as well as the revised code. The only changes that occurred to the code since you last saw it was just a modification in 16.32.024, which is the public tree code section, just uh, based on some of the suggestions of our code compliance uh, coordinator on just ensuring we're using the right terminology and language for our business tax and metro business license, um, which does not change the um, essentially the, the purpose of the code are really much beyond just assuring that folks have a Milwaukee business tax paid or a Metro business license to practice within the city. And that's it. Um, we don't have to ask if there's been any further, I guess not. Public comment part of the hearing is closed. That would include correspondence. Oh, that's right. You did have someone who wanted to comment, but she, she left. She left, so she must. She talked to. And the only part of the tree code that is open for comments, the fee section, which is the next hearing. Ah, uh, uh, okay. But she did leave. Okay, and she checked both tree and fee. Okay. Yep. I think I adjust her uh, addressed her questions out front, but she's welcome to email them and. All right. Is there any council discussion? Again, um, this is a pretty historic piece of code. Uh, there was a council that attempted this once before and was cowed out of it. We lost a lot of trees due to that in the intervening years. When I got on council, uh, actually before I got on council, I was coming to council um, goal setting meetings suggesting that they create some kind of tree code. Uh, and since I've been on council, it's been a goal of mine. I had attempted to get the parks uh, board to work something up and, and they did start the process on the public tree code but this has been a long time coming. Um, it is an important piece of code. Trees are literally the only technology we have for reducing carbon in the atmosphere. Trees are providing one third of the oxygen we breathe uh, and providing numerous other um, benefits to humans. As I've said before, um, this is not a planet of people with trees on it. This is a planet of trees where humans have just arrived. We are utterly dependent on their existence. And this is codifying that reality. I 
again, I'm very proud of this city and this staff and our tree board for years of hard work. Um, and as Councilor Heise opined earlier, we may have made some mistakes. It may not be perfect yet, but it's a hell of a good start. And I'll add that I, we just saw in the news in the past week or two that the city of Portland in two separate studies has seen that their tree cover, their tree canopy has diminished dramatically despite having a tree code. Um, and I shudder to think what it might have been with no tree code. So this is absolutely an essential piece of, of legislation that we are putting into place here. And, and I'm glad that we are taking steps. You know, it has been a challenge because we have heard repeatedly from people who are devastated when a developer comes and clear cuts an entire lot. And, and it's hard for us because we have to say there's nothing we could do. And now we have a tool that will help prevent that from occurring. Um, and I'm really excited to have an answer to give to people now, um, to be able to say that, yes, we, we actually have taken steps that will help to protect those trees. Um, and we just have to see how it's gonna work. I don't mean to sound wishy-washy when I say that, but I really believe that code lives and breathes. And when you have written it, before you've put it out into the world, you don't, you don't really know what you've created. So when I say we've made mistakes, it's not that I think there's something specific, it's that we have to put it out in the world and see how it works with the rest of Milwaukee. And, and I think that's absolutely true of this code as well. And we'll just have to see, but I'm really excited that we can, we can do something like this now. And, um, and the fact that we took this on, once again, thank you, Vera, and thank you, Justin, in particular, for putting up with us um, on this, because we were, we were difficult, but to take on developing the tree code at the same time that we were developing the code for middle housing was essential. And that is the thing that I think other municipalities will look to us for in the future. That's the thing that we really got right. And I'm so grateful for everyone who saw that that was what we needed to do because I think that puts us in a position um, to really succeed on all those fronts. We understand, for better or for worse, after hours and hours of trying to put these things together, that is complicated and that there are all of these moving parts that we need to pay attention to moving forward. Um, so I, I'm thrilled that we get to do this. Um, I hope that we do hear from, you know, the person down the street who's trying to develop their lot, what the experience is like for them. I, I, hope, um, I hope we hear from folks on, on how this is going for them. Um, and I hope that they take Natalie up on her heartfelt offer of, please, if you have questions, just call. Just call, just email. There will be questions. We are doing a lot of outreach going forward. It will take time. Um, but it is worth it for us to learn how to take care of our trees. They are essential parts of the world we live in. I want to know how Natalie and Courtney are going to clone themselves because I think they're going to... <laughs> Proprietary information? <laughs> I think they're going to have a lot of... I mean, I think I see a lot of development coming and I see uh, a lot of code questions, but I, I mean, I agree. I think it's it's important that we... I, I started attending meetings before I was on city council with the Johnson Creek Watershed Council, which was encouraging us to do this. And there were some people from the park and different places who were in these meetings. And so that's, you know, eight, nine, nine, ten years ago. Um, so I, uh, I do see that, um, you know, creating a tree board was the right thing to do rather than keeping it all with the PARB. I mean, that felt like maybe it delayed things, but I mean, we really got the right expertise with the tree board, which isn't necessarily the same expertise for the PARB. So um, I think, yeah, I mean, this one to me, yeah, I think 
as opposed to zoning, which is, you know, something we have a code on, we're making amendments to, this one is really all new, all breaking ground, and um, and we're going to have growing pains with it. And um, But, yeah, I think it's exciting. I didn't prepare remarks, but I did write down... Um, I, I'm really, really grateful to staff, especially for, um, you know, as, as making sure that that we could keep these conversations together. Um, so I'm going to quote Neil from the Watershed Council from February 1st. Are we creating room for trees and people, or are we creating room for vehicles? And it was really important to me that that. That we that we continue to have these conversations together. Um, so I am happy to vote yes on this tonight, and I'm really happy that all of you saw the wisdom in keeping these two code packages together, um, because we can either grow up or we can grow out. We have to grow or we can stay the same, and Milwaukee can be continue to be to be an exclusive place where only certain people get to live. And I think that we have done our damnedest to make sure that we are doing, taking steps to satisfy both our existing res residents and their needs, and also creating space for future residents and trying to accommodate the important infrastructure that is trees. And I am very proud of all of you tonight. So thanks very much. I particularly want to thank Natalie and Peter. This was a ton of work. This was um, really hard, really hard. And it's an impressive piece of code. Thank you. I will share just, I don't know if she wanted me to share, but uh, Courtney Wilson, our urban forester, shared uh, news about our tree code on um, social media. I don't even know which one. I think LinkedIn. Uh, and arborists from around the nation, actually, because it's a close community, have been reaching out and asking to see it, including cities like San Francisco, who don't have a tree code and are looking at implementing their own. So just like our climate action plan, I think that we're going to be a, a leader in, in this work. I hope you send them our middle housing code at the same time. <laughs> no, so we'll send they one really big document. <laughs> a lot of pages, one document. <laughs> and I would like to thank Courtney um, Wilson and um, Galen Hoshovsky, who's our natural resource technician, who is also working on getting his arborist license. So we will have another person, hopefully, to help. and. Uh, they're going through some of this, uh, you know, tumultuous times with us developing a tree code and working on kind of the strategy to implement it. And they've been essential to our team. And I'm really thankful for their help too. Cool. All right, I would entertain a motion. I move. Wait, sorry. No? Hmm? Page 13. Yeah. Top of 13, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I move for the first and second reading. No, is that it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. By title only and adoption of the ordinance amending Milwaukee Municipal Code, MMC, Title 16, Environment for the Purpose of Addressing Tree Preservation. File number ZA-0021-002. I'll second. It has been moved and seconded for first and second readings by title only and adoption of the ordinance amending Milwaukee Municipal Code. MMC Title 16, Environment for the Purpose of Addressing Tree Preservation, file number ZA-2021-002. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 is unanimously. <clears throat> um, Ms. Brooks, would you please read by title only twice? Absolutely. 
an ordinance of the city of Milwaukee, Oregon, amending Milwaukee Municipal Code MMC Title 16, Environment for the Purpose of Addressing Tree Preservation, file number ZA-2021-002. An ordinance of the city of Milwaukee, Oregon, amending Milwaukee Municipal Code MMC Title 16, Environment for the Purpose of Addressing Tree Preservation, file number ZA-2021-002. Mr. Stauffer, would you please pull the council? Councilor Falconer. Aye. Councilor Beatty. Aye. Council President Heise. Aye. Councilor Nicodemus. Aye. Mayor Gamba. Aye. Motion carried five to zero, ordinance 2216. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we were holding our applause to the end. <laughs> well done, everybody. Can I do my second? Thank you for this one, Mayor. Okay, so everything I said before about, but uh, <laughs> but also on this one, um, Peter and Natalie, uh, we would not be here without Peter and Natalie. Um, and their souls and the very fibers of their being are, are in this coat. Um, <laughs> And blood. And, and blood. Tears. Yeah, and uh, so I, I just want to acknowledge the monumental um, effort and passion and um, the fact that you gave so much of yourselves to help um, get this through. So thank you, Peter and Natalie. All right. Master fee schedule revision, tree code fees, resolution. Continued hearing on the proposed tree code changes is called to order. The purpose of this hearing is to continue the hearing on the proposed fee changes, hear the staff report, take public comment, continue council deliberation, and consider adopting the proposed resolution. Does any council member wish to announce an actual or potential conflict of interest? No. Nor do I. None seen. Natalie. No presentation, nothing much to share except that we took in your uh, feedback from last session um, and we adjusted the uh, private non-development tree fee schedule to reflect those different alternatives that you preferred. And with that, it's over for you. And I would like to add too that of course we'll be back and we can always adjust these with time. Yeah, that's the beauty of having the fees separate is that's much easier to adjust as we learn what mistakes we've made. <laughs> um, do we, have we received any correspondence on this? Yes, uh, Mr. Mayor, this uh, evening, just as the regular session was getting underway, we did receive two emails from the same commenter and those are forwarded to the city council. That was from Geraldine Butcher. They will be included in the record. Okay. That's all that I'm aware of. Do we want to take a couple minutes and read those? Because I have not seen them. They won't take long. <laughs> They're short. Other correspondence? No other correspondence, Mr. Mayor. And Teresa had, she didn't feel like she needed to. She just had a, a question around whether or not um, ISA arborists were required to evaluate dead trees, um, in which I informed her that our urban forester is available to make that determination, and she is uh, ISA certified, so it matches our code. Okay. We do have somebody who'd like to speak on Zoom. Okay. Do you want to read the, that part of the oh. script? Oh, yes. We have two people on this. There we go. 
Uh, the council will now take public testimony on the proposed fees. I will recognize speakers and any questions should be addressed through me. When you begin to speak, state your name and city residence for the record. For those who wish to testify, you may submit written comments by email to OCR at MilwaukeeOregon.gov. Staff will read those comments out loud. For those who wish to testify in Zoom, please raise your hand. For those participating in the Zoom webinar by phone, to make a comment, dial star nine to raise your hand. Presentation times for all speakers will be limited. Representatives of groups will be limited to uh, 10 minutes. Individuals will be limited to three minutes. Please confine your remarks to the proposed action, avoid repetition and irrelevant information. Uh, the first person will allow to speak, and Mr. Mayor, would you like us to do the versions where you can see them too, or just where you can hear them? Ideally, where we can see them. Okay. Uh, at this time, I see that Micah Meskel and Anthony Allen have their hands raised, so I will promote Micah to the panel first. Micah, you'll have to accept our invitation to join the panel. Mayor and Council, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Um, Mike Nestle, Milwaukee resident, pick number, and um, I also work for Portland Audubon, who I'll be representing today. Um, I'd like to start with first congratulating um, the city as a whole, staff, and council for, um, for your votes earlier this evening. Um, as many of you noted, it was uh, a monumental effort, and I think the outcome is going to be um, beneficial for um, for Milwaukeeans. Um, I'm especially excited about the tree code um, as uh, on private property, as I, I, we see it as a um, a model for um, other smaller jurisdictions um, than the Portland metro area um, to to lead with a tree preservation um, code that really focuses on, on preserving existing trees. So, so um, I have a couple comments on the, um, on the fee schedule. Um, one of them, or to start, I'd like to follow up on um, Commissioner Heisey's um, comments that it is so important that um, this is a living document and the fee schedule is especially important. Um, I think it's, it, staff um, would benefit greatly from um, tracking the data um, of how that staff fee schedule is implemented and to um, determine if the code is leading to outcomes that we're hoping for, specifically to the retention of large form trees. If we see a um, significant amount of large form trees lost in the, um, in the first couple of years, I, I hope that city council and staff will consider increasing the code to incentivize um, those tree removals. Um, to Councilor Beatty's point, um, I urge council and the city to support um, the tree team um, so they can have the capacity to um, properly implement the code um, and the schedule um, to do and to do so in um, in partnership with community to, to bring them along to navigate the code um, as everyone learns to do a new thing. Um, and it's really important that the team is staffed to do so. And um, and for the future work that the that the um, that the these schedule can help fund. Um, I hope that the city embarks in a collaborative way with community, both for, um, for outreach, but also tree planting and tree maintenance. It's a great opportunity to, um, to forward um, some green job initiatives um, and um, have a, a great partnership with with the city and community partners to do so. And lastly, um, following the passage of these these um, awesome codes. We really hope that the city um, embarks on um, a similar code for commercial and industrial lands. Those, um, those land uses are even more important to have um, to have tree canopy on as um, they're most, you know, the most intensive land use um, in the city. And it's hugely important that we require commercial and industrial landowners um, to do the same thing we're asking um, of local residents to do in, in uh, both protecting the trees, but um, and as importantly, the land the ones to ensure that they are doing their fair share and that we're um, working to, um, to reduce their urban heat islands 
in, in those um, zones, zones and protect the natural resources, resources that, that are often adjacent, adjacent to especially the industrial zones um, in, in the city. city. And yeah, yeah I, I just, just again, um, I want to amend that and um, uh, main mission and CPIC and, and council for um, meeting a great process, process around CPIC and the, the tree trade code and um, really, really excited about, about the implementation. Thank you. Okay, and now, Mr. Mr. Allen, we're going to be promoting you to the panel. Please accept the invitation to join the panel, Anthony Allen. Yes, we can. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I'd like to start first with uh, agreeing, uh, well, congratulating the EU on, on, on assessing the green code as well. With a uh, small uh, percentage of it, uh, most of it I do. Uh, I, I would like to, uh, to just tag on what, what Mika had just lastly stated. I, I, I do. Uh, feel that the, the the city is missing or has missed and or maybe currently missing an opportunity to address the entities that most do harm to our societies with the lack of tree code and that is industrial and commercial uses as well as uh, larger uh, apartment complexes, condominiums and such. I, I, the, the code really addresses uh, residential areas and, and, and I don't even think it strongly regulates large, larger structures. So, so that, that, that's a, a, a point that I think the city has missed uh, an opportunity on. My question that I have is uh, while I did listen in on the last meeting, and I understand that for people who uh, infringe upon getting permits and cutting trees, that the, the fee essentially doubles. Uh, what is the consequence for uh, for the for the resident who does not get a permit uh, and they? simply either do not have the ability to pay or won't pay because as one council uh, person had mentioned earlier I am positive that as many people that you've heard of from and as many people that know about this code I do think the city has, has been not very efficient in getting the information out to the majority of residents. So my fear is that there are going to be people who simply do not know about these changes of code, surprisingly as that might seem to you. What will be the consequences to the person who actually takes down a large tree is hit with uh, the fines that they will be subjected to and will not be able to pay. Uh, so yeah, that, that, that's my question. Uh, and thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'd be happy to answer those. So there, I see, uh, I heard two parts. The first one was asking about um, the essentially inability to pay. We have a few mechanisms in the code that allow for adjustment of fees. Uh, for one thing, we do have low income assistance within our tree code on the permit fee. So hopefully folks can reach out ahead of that and we can assist them with any permit fees they might need to pay. Um, but if say they remove a tree without a permit and they are hit with a fee, we have a process where they're allowed to talk to our city manager and get a fee reduction at the city manager and does need to inform council on that. Um, and then there's a second stage where if um, it goes to our judge, our judge can also reduce those fees after hearing what the, their story is or their circumstances or hardships. Um, the second component to that is the outreach and education around the tree code. This has been something that we've been trying to work with internally. Um, you know, it's kind of difficult to do a lot of outreach and education when we don't have the adopted code simply because we 
things can change and we don't want to inform people incorrectly and cause an issue that way. Um, this next hopefully 30 days before implementation but, uh, on May 19th is going to be go time for our team. We're planning on doing mailers out to the community. We're planning on pilot insert social media posts, outreach materials. We're working with consultants on drafting numerous fact sheets that we'll have both in person as well as online. Um, essentially, we're going to try to get the word out as much as possible. And I actually found our community survey very insightful on how we can best do that. Um, I will be at the farmer market on May 22nd if folks would like to come and say hi to me and ask any questions. Um, but, you know, we're going to make every effort possible to make sure everyone in the community knows about it. Um, and uh, like we've said before, call us email us. 503-786-7655 uh, is our urban forest line. They can also email us at urbanforest at milwaukeeoregon.gov or they can visit us in person at 6101 Southeast Johnson Creek at our public works facility um, and we can see if either uh, somebody can come down and talk to them or at least get their contact information so I can reach out personally. There was also a comment, I mean, I think one of them we've already addressed, which is that, you know, this, there is, I mean, everyone recognizes that, 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 that there's also a need for addressing tree canopy on commercial, but I wanted you to maybe clarify the other half of that, which was, you know, I, I am, I'm reading this to apply to residential zones and not distinguish between certain residential zones. Correct. Can you please answer that question? Yeah, so this code applies to all residentially zoned properties. So be that uh, multifamily on residentially zoned properties as well as single, fam uh, single um, homes, um, and dwellings, so that's kind of how this code was written to complement the housing and parking changes happening to our residential zones. Um, we also recognize that there's future protections needed for our commercially zoned properties, including commercial multifamily housing, um, as well as industrial properties, business parks, et cetera. Um, but this is kind of the first, actually the first bite was our public tree code revisiting that. This is the second bite, but we do have the whole apple to go. So we're hoping to, that this is kind of um, the next stage and we're always gonna be moving on to the next one until we feel like we've um, equally protected our canopy across the city. Thank you. Okay, any more comments? I'll double check the email, Mr. Mayor, hold on. No more, no more emails and no more hands raised. Okay. And no comment. Do you have further response to any of the comments? Just reminding folks they're welcome to reach out if they have any questions or any comments after this and I'm happy to talk it out with them. Does council have any more questions for staff? I'll move to close the public comment part of the hearing on the proposed tree code fees. I'll second. It has been moved and seconded to close the public comment part of the hearing on the proposed tree code fees. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None heard. Public comment period of the public hearing on the proposed tree code amendments is closed. Is there any council discussion? It's after nine. I've got nothing left to <laughs> <laughs> she turns into a pumpkin. Well, um, good code isn't good code unless it has teeth. Right. This is the teeth. So, I would entertain a motion then. I move to approve the resolution revising fees and charges and updating section five of the master fee schedule for fiscal years 2021 and 20, oh, because I guess we're doing the other one in a couple of weeks. Okay, 2021 and 2022. I second. It has been moved and seconded to approve the resolution revising fees and charges and updating section five of the master fee schedule for fiscal years 2021 and 2022. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None heard. It passes unanimously. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> well, we're 35 minutes ahead of schedule. Rock. <laughs> that never happens. 
I will entertain a motion to adjourn <laughs> and go have a birthday drink. <laughs> I just threw you for a loop, didn't I? I move to adjourn. I'll second. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 We are adjourned.